Okay. Nan says she still can't log into the exam. Well, tell her to come to class uh, because I cannot wait her and she didn't communicate at all. So I cannot delay the class. So you want to wait for, the, for her, right? It's going to be taking some time. So tell her just to come to class, okay? And then she will talk to me later. All right, so let's start. Uh, okay, so it's recording now. Uh, let's get uh, my mouse. All right. All right, so welcome to lecture number seven in bioscience. This is one of the probably is like a, a very important topic for many topics that are coming later. So knowing what we are going to learn today, you're going to have, for example, the, uh, the knowledge to talk about diabetes mellitus later on when you are going to be in a search. So all these concepts that you will learn today is going to help you to understand the pharmacology and the pathophysiology of the disease that are coming later. Not only diabetes mellitus, but for example, alcoholism, fasting, etc. right? So some um, metabolic disorders that can happen during uh, these situations. So please, please, I want you to pay attention for every single thing that we are going to talk today, and especially what I'm going to remark, okay? And the last, the second part is a very big topic. It's a very long topic. This topic is the gastrointestinal system, gastrointestinal system. And we will talk about general things. Uh, obviously, we are going to remark that in anatomy, physiology, in next course, but definitely GI tract is just one class of every day for one week. So I have only one hour, one hour and a half. So I'm trying to put all together in that time without losing or sacrificing any information. You will have everything in place. All right, so let's uh, let's start nutrients and processing of metabolism. Okay, so for this, I want just to, and please uh, welcome your participation. Participation will be just, mm, uh, mm, yes, good, something like that. If you want to say more, much, I'm going to be very welcome because please take advantage and I'm asking you to, if you have any questions, just tell me, whatever questions. If I don't, don't be afraid that I don't know, I don't know. If I don't know, if that is the case, I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, I will investigate. But please feel free and feel safe in this uh, class that, to ask everything and uh, make your time worth as to the maximum, please, okay? All right, so let's get started. So nutrient processing and metabolism. So let's read that these two, uh, before that, you see this fire, you see this uh, this type, uh, uh, this letter on that. These fires, these letters are basically telling you that uh, I highlight this for final exam, for the midterm exam, or quizzes in general. So the more uh, spectacular will be the remark here in as a graphic, more, most likely is coming, right? So, but it's a rule. I have like... 300 of these distributed in all the all the course, so I can take whatever is actually uh, the turn to uh, for that for the next quiz. Okay, all right. So it can be included, but not only that. It can be other stuff too. All right, but this is like a study guide. So nutrient processing and metabolism. Let's read that these two uh, uh, lines: digestion, absorption, and the conversion of nutrients in energy. Okay, so what does it mean? So first of all, I want you to know what is digestion. Digestion, please just think about in one word only. What is digestion? So you are digestion. You have uh, you have a digestion of the food, right? What does it really means? Digestion in one word is to break, break down the bones of the nutrients. Break down. So you're going to break it down. So that is what you're doing. So when you are putting an apple in your mouth and chew it, so the first crash, that is already, you are digesting the food. You are digesting the food. You put a piece of bread in your mouth, the first chew it, the first 
moment that you're chewing that, that is already start that digestion. Okay, digestion is actually what is digestion? Breakdown. What is digestion? Breakdown. Breakdown what? Breakdown the food, right? In pieces because the food needs to be in small, small molecules in order to be able to be absorbed by the by the intestine. Okay, what is absorption? Absorption is basically when a nutrient pass or a substance pass from one place through another place, uh, uh, through an, uh, towards another place, through uh, a, a membrane. So they need to pass a cell membrane. When they pass from one place to another place, passing a, a, a cell membrane, that is going to be called absorption. Where is happening this absorption? The absorption is happening at the level of the intestines. Large intestine, small intestine are going to be the area where mostly of the nutrients obviously are being digested, but, uh, but digest are going to be able to be absorbed. So digestion and absorption. So please, I want you to give you a different angle of this, nursing angle. If you have bad digestion, if you have bad digestion means that you cannot break down efficiently the food in small molecules. So what happened with absorption? The absorption are going to be actually poor absorption, going to have uh, have a poor absorption of that nutrient. Why? Because the molecules are already are too big to be absorbed. So digestion and absorption are coming hand by hand. If you have some problem with digestion, digestion, you're not going to absorb. Uh, 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 There's not going to be a good absorption of the nutrients. So digestion is going to imply many things, many things. And I will tell you now, digestion. Digestion, we have two types of digestion. One type of digestion is the mechanical digestion. Mechanical. Mechanical digestion. And the other one is the chemical digestion. Chemical digestion. So don't forget that. So mechanical is going to break down the food while chewing, right? Your teeth. That's why you have teeth. Yeah? Your teeth are going to help to break down the nutrients in a small piece. Breakdown, 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 breakdown. Chemical, chemical, we have the saliva, that is actually what we are going to talk later, but uh, to make it more uh, actually, I would say, uh, easy to remember, just remember the gastric acid, the gastric acid, the chemical, chemical. Chemical is the chlorhydric acid, the chlorhydric acid, chlorhydric acid. Hydric acid, right? The HCl, HCl, HCl. That is acid, 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 acid. Who is giving the acidity? The hydrogens. So we will talk about another time. So chemical is the chewing when you are chewing, right? And chemical are going to be the gastric acid. There is other other ones, other substances, right? We have the saliva, we have the amylase, the protease, the and, and uh, uh, the lipids are going to be uh, substances, chemicals that are going to help digestion. Digestion. So just remember: so nutrient processing and metabolism. Uh, metabolism is the goal for this part of the of the, of the lecture. Processing it means the digestion and the absorption, and the metabolism is how the body is going to use those nutrients after the absorption and that is basically happening in the liver in the liver you remember that everything that you eat they go to the stomach to the intestines and then from the intestines go to the bloodstream go to the bloodstream where they go after that they go to the bloodstream in the from the bloodstream mostly are going to go to the liver to the liver to the liver where it's going to produce the metabolism what is metabolism Metabolism is how your body produces energy, just to remind you what we talked in the previous classes. Metabolism is the summation, in addition, you can say metabolism is the summation of reactions, anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. And the catabolic reaction is when, when they break down 
the, the bond of the, of the molecule release energy. And anabolism is how they use that energy to build up structures like new proteins, for example. So that is a summary. So that is something that we talked in the previous class. If you have any questions, that is the moment to ask. Okay. All right. So nutrient processing and metabolism. See how many, how much, how much we can talk about that, right? So digestion, absorption, and that conversion of nutrients in energy. What is that conversion of nutrients in energy? That is the definition of metabolism. You got it? So in order to have a good metabolism, you need to have absorption and previous the digestion. And if any of these areas are going to fail, are going to fail, that is going to basically uh, have malnourishment on the patient. So they cannot use energy. We okay with that? We all right? Yep. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So now cellular metabolism. Cellular metabolism is basically, I told you when, uh, when the, the nut you eat, digest, absorb, go to the bloodstream, then they go to the liver. In the liver, where they go? To the cells, to the cells of the liver, right? That is the big example because all the nutrients, they can go to the whole body. The whole cells are going to have cellular metabolism, not only the liver. The whole body, they have cellular metabolism because each cell is like an individual. They individually, they need energy. They need actually to form energy to complete his all activities, okay? All right, so cellular metabolism, including the liver, including all the cells of the body, is the sum is the summation of all chemical reactions, anabolic and catabolic within the cell. In this lecture, we'll be focusing in energy metabolism. Be okay with that? All right, perfect. Look at this picture. Look at that. We have glucose. This is a molecule of glucose. This is a molecule of fatty acids. So this is a cell. Uh, uh, yes, this is a cell. This is representing cell. This guy is representing the mitochondria. Is the mitochondria? Remember, we was talking uh, in the previous class that is the um, the uh, battery, right? Is the uh, energy engine where it's located in every single cell. So the mitochondria. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. All right, so energy metabolism. Energy metabolism is the summation of, well, we already talked about that, using the chemical energy trap in the molecules of food. Okay, so that is what I want you to get because probably it's the last time somebody is going to tell you, right? In the next, probably, yes, reality is the, the last, probably the last time. So that's class. So you have here a molecule, a, 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 an atom, and another atom that produce a molecule, this is a molecule, these are bind, they're like bind, they're going to be attracted by, uh, uh, by forces, covalent, ionic, whatever you want, right? But those are attract between them. When you disrupt this bond, this bond of the glucose or fatty acids or proteins are going to disappear, and what happened? the energy is going to be released. Energy is going to be released. Energy, energy, energy. This energy will not be lost, but it's going to be transformed. And that energy, what it's going to do is to take and form the ATPs. ATPs, ATPs. I know that probably you have one more step in your, in your mind. We are going to go on that in a few moments. But that is what I want you to remember at this moment, general. Food is the source of energy to produce ATP. And are the ATPs, the ATPs that we are going to use as a form of energy. You are looking at the, uh, at the screen, you are writing, you are focusing, you are listening. All these need, need energy. So at this moment, right now, you are consuming ATPs. Your body is using and producing ATPs all the cells, your nerve cells, your muscle cells, your connective tissue, your epithelial tissue, all everything is forming right now ATPs. From where? 
from the energy that is coming from the, the nutrients. Okay? So, be okay with that? So, in conclusion, using the chemical energy trap in the molecules of food. Where are these energy traps? Are in the, in the bones. Okay? All right. So, uh, let me see if I have here. I'm going to make another slide. Okay. All right. So, what are the sources of energy? Are going to be glucose. That is number one. Number one is why? Because it's easy and faster for the body to uh, obtain energy from the glucose from the molecule of glucose. Okay, glucose, glucose, glucose. Glucose is the number one. Is the money in your pocket? So you want to buy something immediately, money out, right? But if when the glucose is not present because you are starving or you are fasting or you are actually having some problems, other diseases like diabetes, etc., you cannot use use glucose. The body is going to still hungry and they are going to try to use another source and that source is the fats. Fats. Fat is the second source after the glucose, okay? So the fats are going to be like the money in your bank. So the money in your pocket are the glucose, very easy, fast money. And the fats, when you don't have money, you go to the bank. What I'm trying to tell you here, that in order to, to complete the, the purchase of whatever you're doing, the glucose money in your pocket is almost immediately but fat you're going to take the energy but you need to take a while it's taking a while because you need to go to the bank take the money out so that is telling you that the glucose is faster fast in order to obtain energy. the fats you can you you can obtain energy from the fat but it's going to take longer you want proof of that i'm going to give you proof of that right now when you are tired, so you for you didn't take breakfast and you are in class in bioscience and actually you feel like tired and drowsy or whatever, right? So what you're going to do? You're going to take your actually cup of coffee with sugar. What is actually contributing that is the sugar. So the sugar is going to give you that boost right away in a few moments. In one minute, two minutes, you start to feel that actually heating or, uh, is going to increase your energy levels. But you don't eat fat. Also, I feel weak. I'm going to eat fat. The fat is going to give you energy, but you need to wait uh, uh, more than a few minutes uh, actually to, to obtain the energy. So that is proof that the body is easier for the body to use glucose rather than fat, right? Glucose, money in your pocket, fat, uh, money in your bank. You okay with that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we have this, you have the food here with the element that we say the glucose, the fat, they are going to break down the, break the bones, break the bones. So that is two are going to release, are going to release energy. This energy is going to be produced, or what we said, are going to produce the ATPs. 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 Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Now, what is an ATP? ATP, A, means adenosine. A means adenosine. Okay, A means adenosine, uh, T means three. Okay, three means three, right? Three, so three is like this, of course, it's not like, I don't know how to write three, but three is in, this is the suffix, right? Three. And P means phosphate. Phosphate. Three means phosphate. All right, so we have here the adenosine, like this. We have one phosphate, 
הנואל פוספייט, הנואל פוספייט. So we have three phosphates, okay? So I'm going to put it like this better. All right, adenosine triphosphate. So now, these phosphate are going to be producing the mitochondria. And this phosphate, we have, we have, these are going to be high bonds who has a lot of energy here in these bonds, in these bonds. That is what we call the ATP. That is happening in the mitochondria, and that is the charged battery. It's a charged battery. So this battery is charged. So that is what you use to your flashlight, to the drill, whatever you want to use as a battery, right? So that is a charge, so ready to produce, uh, uh, release the energy that we use for our functions. So what happened? This is the ATP. And the ATP, in order to initiate that energy that we are using, they are going to break down. They are going to break down this phosphate. So this phosphate is going away. So this phosphate, when they go away, when they go away, they are going to release the energy that is being used for the uh, protein pumps that we talked about in the previous one. Uh, active transportation, right? So any any action of the body are going to use that energy. So now the ATP is not anymore ATP. Now it's going to be called the ADP. We have adenosine, one phosphate, and another phosphate, only two. So that's why it's called ADP, ADP. And the ADP is the adenosine, Di means two phosphate. All right, so the ADP. We okay with that? All right. So now this is the uncharged battery. Uncharged battery. This is the uncharged battery. So now we can recharge the battery again. Yes, we can recharge the battery again. How we are going to recharge the battery again? So this phosphate, oh my God, where I put him, it was three, right? I don't know what happened with this. Okay. Oh, so this was actually uh, go out. So in order to to recharge the battery, going back from ADP to ATP, we need to make the one phosphate get attached again back to the ADP. So this energy, so it's like you bring in, I told you, bring your books to one room to another room. The books are the phosphate. Okay, you want to pass the books to one room to another room. So you are not going to pass the, the books just sinking and floating in the air, right? So you're going to use your energy to bring the books and put it in the other room. The books are the phosphate and, the, and you are the energy that is coming from the food, from the food. So that is going to make, bring the phosphate into the ADP to form the, now the ATP again. Is that clear or not? Yeah. Yes, it's clear. Everybody got it? So please, that is important, okay? Now, here we are going to see, uh, when I will tell, try to tell you something, there's some, some kind of mistake on the student. So when you write down, for example, anything, right? You, let's write down one, two, three, four, five, six, a number. You're not writing like one, two, three, four, upside down, no? Or the other, or the opposite. You're going to write down like from the left to the right, correct? One, two, three, four, correct? So that is the same thing you're going to use for the phosphate. Phosphate number one is this one. Phosphate number two and phosphate number three. You're not going to put me one, two, three, right? So you write like normal numbers. One, two, three is from the left to the right, okay? One, two, and three. So why is important to know this? Why? Because they're going to ask you, where are, where, in which bond, in which bond 
are going to be the highest energy in the ATP. The highest energy of the ATP is between the second and the third phosphate, not between the first and the second. It's going to be in between the second and the third. So here is where we have the highest energy of the ATP. ATP. You okay with that? Yep. Okay. So just extra here, we have the AMP. That is another one that is uh, more advanced. Is when you lose two phosphates, the AMP. Okay. So adenosine monophosphate. So that is another term. But at this moment, we are going to just remember ADP, ATP. ATP turns into ADP that is uncharged and the uh, uh, and ADP turns into ATP that is the charged molecule. Okay? Okay? Yes. Yeah, can you give me a second, please? As, you know, I, I start to wish to go to the school instead of be here. Okay, just a moment, please. Give me one minute. Okay, so sorry for that. Uh, where is my pen now? Oh. Okay. Oh. All right, so let's continue. All right, so let's continue. So here we have the energy metabolism. We have using the chemical energy trap in the molecule of the food. And turning, and turning into energy of the, of the bond between the second and the third phosphate. So that is where we have the highest energy in the, this ATP, between the second and the third phosphate, okay? All right, so let's keep moving. So here we have ATP is equal to say the ADP plus the phosphate, phosphorus, okay? Phosphorus. These phosphorus are going to, basically, if you make, uh, there is like a formula here. So just a moment, just a moment. I cannot stand this. Just a moment, please. I'm sorry. I, I cannot. Just a moment, please. Okay. Okay, so here we have in this cartoon you see here. We, let's see what it says here. Look at that. So we have three ATPs here, three I mean one ATP with three phosphates, three a three. So then what happened is releasing one of the phosphates, one of the phosphates. And then the phosphate is getting, actually get into the ADP to produce ATP. So ATP, ADP, ATP. Now ADP, 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 
ATP. So it's coming in and out the molecule of phosphorus. So that is basically how it's going to charge and on charge. We okay with that? Okay, so the ATP is a, a nucleotide. A nucleotide, you already remember in your in your uh, previous classes, uh, you was talking about the basis of the DNA. What are the basis of the DNA? If this is the DNA, I'm going to make it like this, that bonds, uh, here we have these like stairs, the steps, these are the bases, all called nucleotide, nucleotide, all called nucleotide, nucleotide, okay? So this nucleotide, one of these is the adenine. So we have many of these. We have adenine. We have other base that is the, um, the uh, thymine. Thymine. We have the cytosine. And we have the one, uh, one, one scene, one is in. Oh, what's our one is in? One in, sorry. We have the one in. The one in is a uh, one in, one nine. One in are going to be the basis, similar to adenine. So adenine is part of the uh, DNA, but it's not the only area where we have this uh, this adenine is going to be located as well in the ATP. ATP is not DNA. Okay, it's a difference. It's like you have a brick that a brick that is part of the wall of your house and you have a brick that the other brick that is part of the Empire State or whatever Sears or whatever other building. Right. So actually different different scenes but they they have uh, are located in different uh, adenosine is it can be located in the ATPs and adenosine in the uh, DNA. All right, so uh, ATP is a nucleotide or it's a base, right? Produced through the cellular respiration. What is cellular respiration? Cellular respiration, cellular respiration, the cells, as I told you, the cells is like you and me. We are breathing, we're taking oxygen, we are going to uh, we take oxygen, we take fluids, we pee, we poo, we reproduce, etc. We grow, right? So all these are going to be part of the of the cell uh, uh, of the cell functions. One of these is the cellular respiration. So we need oxygen. Yes, the cell need oxygen. Why do we need oxygen? Because the oxygen is going to make all chemical reactions to happen. So you cannot make fire without oxygen. What is a fire? Fire is a chemical reaction that is going to produce fire, right? So you cannot make fire if you don't have oxygen. So that is exactly what happened in the cells. You cannot have chemical reactions to produce to uh, chemical reaction without using oxygen. 99% of chemical reactions, 99% of chemical reactions in the body they need oxygen, okay? All right, so we okay with that? So a conclusion about this is, what is the conclusion about this slide? What I want you to know about this slide is in order to produce ATPs, we need oxygen. We okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay, write it down that. Yep. In order to produce ATPs, we require, we need the oxygen, okay? All right, so that is, this is the mitochondria. All this is the mitochondria. This guy is the mitochondria. And here we have electron. As I mentioned in the past, electron is the same to say energy, energy, electron, e -e -e, electron, e -e -e, energy, energy, electron. So when I said electron, I'm going to mention about what is, what is, is actually energy, okay? And we will see that in a few moments. So here we have the cytosol. Cytosol is actually the same to say cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. So if you see here, the uh, cytoplasm is where it's coming, uh, where it's going to be the glucose. Remember the absorption? The absorption is going to 
Absorption is going to make the glucose get into the cells. Absorption is going to get the uh, glucose get into the cells, right? So for through facilitated diffusion. So the glucose imagine is floating in the cytoplasm. Then the glucose are going to be processed and is getting during in that process is going to be uh, is going to get into the mitochondria, and that mitochondria are going to produce ATPs based on the glucose that was entering into the cell. So that is where the ATPs are going to be formed inside the mitochondria. When the ATPs are formed inside the mitochondria, then the ATPs can go out of the mitochondria and distribute it any place in the cell who are required as energy. You okay? You okay with that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now, here we have the metabolism, metabolism summary. This metabolism summary are going to be that uh, we have, it looks like we, this is something that we are going to learn today. So all of these are going to be learned today. And it looks like it's complicated, but it's very, at the end, simple. So number one, so we have the nutrients. We have on one side, we have carbohydrates in green, carbohydrates in green. We have the fats here in pink or red, whatever color you want to see, fat and lipid. And here we have the proteins. Here we have the protein. So this is a source of energy, carbohydrates. Fat and lipids as a source, are a source of energy as well. Only when you feel, when you are not having more carbohydrates, you're going to use fat and lipids. Proteins. Proteins eat the primary the primary function of the protein is not to produce energy. It's not. But we can get energy from proteins. And when we use proteins, we use proteins only as a last resource when we already, uh, when we are actually uh, deplete all the carbohydrates and when we deplete the fats and lipids. That is the moment that we use proteins. Okay, so now we have this all green here. All this green is carbohydrates, the, uh, uh, the process of metabolism of carbohydrates, same for proteins and same for lipids. And look at this. Here we have what we call the secret acid cycle that is called the Krebs cycle. That is the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle. This Krebs cycle is happening in the inside the mitochondria. That is where it's happening the Krebs cycle in the mit within the mitochondria. So you have carbohydrates here. That is the glucose. They're going to go a lot of process, lot of process, and then they go into the Krebs into the mitochondria to suffer the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle. What they're doing is Krebs cycle. Please don't overlook that cycle. I say cycle. It's a circle. So it's what? Why is this circle telling you? This circle is telling you that we have many reactions: one, two reactions, three reactions, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve reactions, and are going to recycle again. Twelve reactions. In each reaction, in each reaction, they are going to release electrons. Electrons. They are going to release electrons inside the mitochondria, and this. Electrons is the one who is having the energy to bring the phosphate and glue it to the ADP to form ATP. Is that clear or not? It's clear. It's clear or not? Hello? Yes. Yes, it's clear. All right, so please uh, pay attention to this, okay? It's very important. So I need you, I need really you to. Be, uh, you need to really uh, be sure that you understand this. We are going to go in different angle and, and, and one more time. All right, so here is the cyclic acid, the Krebs cycle. And you said, why you have hydrogens here, right? So, but I said electrons, right? Why is it electrons? Why? Because the hydrogen is this, right? Hydrogen, remember hydrogen, we were just talking in the previous classes. Hydrogen is one proton and one electron, correct? Yes or no? Right? Yes. Okay. So now, this is positive, right? Why is positive? Why? Because this hydrogen is going to lose one electron. So that's why it's positive. 
is going to lose one electron. And that's where you can positive. That electron, where did it go? This electron is the one who is going to produce the ADPC electron. They're going to get into, they're going to glue the ADP, one phosphate, to produce ATPs. Is that clear or not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now we have phosphorus inside the phosphorus inside the cell, right? Phosphorus should be important, be inside the cell, correct? Now, what I want you to remember is this. What is the most important intracellular anion? What is the most important intracellular anion? Not sure. Remember, we were talking about the plate, the salt shaker. Sodium. Sodium and, sodium and chloride are going to be in the extracellular. So this is a must, okay? Everybody need to know these are going to ask questions next class. Doesn't matter if we, previous class are going to ask that, that next class, but sure. So you must remember what is extracellular and what are the intracellular anions and cations that are more important. The most important cation outside extracellular is the sodium. And the anion extracellular is the chloride. Chloride. That is a must. If you want to know pathophysiology later on, how the muscle contract, electrical impulses go, control the neurotransmitters and heart activity, you must know that. Otherwise, we will be swimming in the middle of the ocean at night. Okay? So please, everybody, all right? Okay, so the most important intracellular uh, cation is going to be the potassium. And the most important intracellular anion is the phosphate, phosphate. So you understand now that why we need phosphorus inside the cell. So you understand now why the phosphate are the most important anion in the intracellular, because that phosphate is the source to produce ATPs. Is that clear, everybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's keep moving. All right. So we have uh, different, uh, different. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about triglycerides. I'm going to tell you now. So we have fats, and the fats are going to be uh, classified. So fat, we have lipids, right? Fat or lipids are basically the same. Please don't be afraid to say lipids or fats. Fat, lipids, fat, lipids, fat is the same. The fats are going to be classified in in uh, in what fatty acids? That is your class the previous week, right? Fatty acids, fatty acids, saturated and saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. So that is something that you already know from previous class. Second, the other classification is the triglycerides. Triglycerides the triglycerides, triglycerides. This is another, what is triglyceride? Lipid. What is triglyceride? Fat. What is fatty acid? Fat. What is fatty acid? Lipid, right? So the, and the third one, there is different type of classification, but for nursing and medical, medical school, you need to know this one, okay? And the third one is the cholesterol. Is that cholesterol, right? Is that cholesterol. We have the cholesterol, triglycerides, and fatty acids. All right. So from this, the triglycerides is called three because they have three fatty acids. Three fatty acids. These three fatty acids are going to be attached. I'm going to draw fatty acid here. This is one fatty acids like this. Let's make it like that. So the fatty acids are going to be one, two, and three fatty acids that are going to be attached to a molecule of glycerol. Glycerol, where's glycerol? Glycerol. 
the glycerol. So these molecules are going to be break it down. When they break down, they're releasing the glycerol from the fatty acids. My God. Okay. They are going to release. So the glycerol is disappearing and they are going to turn into fatty acids. They go here now. Okay. Fatty acids. So this is where you're going to obtain the energy. You don't obtain energy from the triglycerides. The triglycerides, they need to be transformed first into fatty acids. Okay. So are the fatty acids who are going to produce energy. You ask me about cholesterol. Cholesterol, we don't use, I'll write it down, we do not use cholesterol for energy. We do not use cholesterol for energy. We do not use cholesterol for energy. Okay? Cholesterol cannot be transformed into energy. Okay, Only the triglycerides and the fatty acids. Triglycerides, they need to decompose into fatty acids, and then the fatty acids are going to turn into the energy. Into energy. All right, so let's get to start with this. I mentioned here, this is the eight, this is the ATP and this is the ADP. So it's charging. The ADP is charging, the ATP is already charged. All right, so let's keep going. So ATP is like a rechargeable battery. So we repeat already several times. All right, so every cell in the body must be able to take energy. So we have 100 trillion cells in your body and from these 100 trillion, all of them, they need energy. They are not going to exist like magic, right? They need to use energy, right? From the breakdown of carbohydrate fats to make ATPs. Proteins, yes, but only when you're skin and bones, that is when you're going to uh, use proteins. Before, no. This process of converting the chemical energy of glucose or fat into energy of ATP is called cellular respiration question for the exam okay so we have ATP is actually uh, uh, in order to uh, to produce ATP we have the cellular respiration what is about this is what I mentioned that as a conclusion in order to produce ATP we need oxygen who not who need, who need oxygen you know what is that not don't, don't think about the oxygen you breathe in the oxygen that after you breathe in, the oxygen, they go to the cells. So where they're going, the oxygen. The oxygen is going to eat each of the cells of your body. So that's why you need huge amounts of oxygen, right? So oxygen is going to be called respiration. But at the level of the cell, it's called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration. You okay with that? Cellular respiration. You okay? Yes. Okay. So don't forget that conclusion so far is that the, to produce ATP is going to go through a process called the cellular respiration. You know, the glucose get into the mitochondria, but all these reactions, they need oxygen. The glucose get into the cell, then the, it's process and get into the mitochondria. The, the process, my, uh, glucose, Inside the mitochondria, they need oxygen, the cellular respiration, in order to have all these chemical reactions on the Krebs cycle that release electrons to produce ATPs. Okay? So, sounds complicated or no? Easy, right? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so we have micronutrients. Break the, so, what I put here? Okay. So this is two slides, what they say. So cellular respiration process of cell catabolism in which the cell turn food in usable energy in the form of ATP. Cellular respiration. So I just forget about all these definitions. Yes, the cell needs oxygen, period. For what? To produce ATPs. Just use your own words. Don't try to, do, let's not try to memorize definitions that are actually kind of very static, very rigid. So let's do something that is more flexible and easy. Okay. All right, so here we are going to see the macronutrients. What are the macronutrients? The macronutrients are going to be the carbohydrates, the fats, and the, and the proteins. Okay, macronutrients. Why macro is, means big, but big molecules, no. Please, one more time, the last time. 
So we are not talking about big molecules. We are talking about big amounts, big volumes of the food. That's why it's called macro. We have bigger amounts of carbohydrates, bigger amounts of proteins, not because the carbohydrate fat and protein molecules are big. No, because we need huge or more volume of these nutrients, macronutrients. We call that micronutrient with I, micronutrients are going to be the vitamins, the minerals. And that why it's called micro, not because they're, they're, they're small, is because we are going to use in small amounts, in small volumes, volumes. Okay, I'm not talking about size here, all right? Okay, so there you are. So we have uh, micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Nutrients processing, first uh, ingestion. Ingestion is when something you put in your mouth. You put it in your mouth, that is ingestion. You're swallowing, right? Then it's going to, well, almost in the mouth, start the ingestion and start the digestion. Digestion start in the mouth with the saliva, with the teeth. They are going to go to the stomach. So ingestion. So you cannot digest if you don't eat anything, right? So ingestion is first, digestion is second. Ingestion, taking food and drink into the body by the mouth. So you have an apple here. Uh, the food here, when it's in the mouth, is called the bolus. Bolus, 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 bolus. The food in the mouth is called bolus. Okay? Bolus is going to be, going to draw it here. This is the bolus. Here's the bolus. Bolus is keep going to the esophagus. Bolus, 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 bolus. And when they get into the stomach, when they get into the stomach here, the food in the stomach, they are going to be called chyme. Chyme. That is the change of the name, right? So bolus and then chyme. Chyme is called when it's in the stomach. Digestion means breakdown. Right, so for the third time we're repeating that more probably. So breakdown, digestion in one word, breakdown of food into simple chemical compounds. So food can be absorbed and assimilated by the body. Okay, so there is one word that you must ask me at this moment. Do you, do you have a question? So you need to understand everything that we have in the slide. You need to understand every single word. So, what is this word assimilation? So, see, if, you, if you're going to create gaps, you have a big gap at the end. Right? So, you need to... Important definitions, you need to very much know every single word. What is assimilation? Probably you think that assimilation is the same as absorption. Yes or no? Somebody think that assimilation is the same as absorption? The answer is no. Absorption and assimilation, absorption, assimilation, some similar or equivalent, equivalent or, uh, or synonym, but they are not. Okay? Assimilation is when the nutrients become part of your body. So assimilation is not absorption. Assimilation is not absorption. So some people assimilate better the food than others. So that means that, for example, they are going to use the proteins to produce some structures in the body. So when this already part of your body, oh, can you excuse me, please? Oh, this is cool again. Just a moment, please. Okay. Okay, so that is assimilation. Assimilation is when the nutrients are going to become part of your body. Okay? All right, so here we have the digestion are going to have two components. Mechanical digestion that we already talked and the chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion, 
mechanical digestion are going to be when you are chewing. Chemical digestion is when you have the enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that are, what is an enzyme? An enzyme is going to accelerate chemical reactions. Accelerate chemical reactions. That is what is an enzyme. And the enzyme will be, for example, the lipase, the protease, and the amylase. Some of them. Okay? So we have these enzymes that are going to uh, produce the digestion of the food. So we have two types of digestion, chemical and mechanical. Digestion are going to turn complex molecules formed into, uh, are too large to become absorbed. So the GI tract break down into smaller molecules. Starches, starch that is a, a polysaccharide are going to turn into mono, monomer, the glucose, the proteins into amino acids, the lipids into fatty acids. All right, so polymers are hydrolyzed into monomers, especially when we are talking about the carbohydrates. And what, what is the, what is hydrolyzed? Hydrolyzed means water. So polymers, so you put the starch in your mouth. So the saliva has water. What is the saliva? Saliva is equal water plus amylase plus electrolytes. So that is your saliva. Your saliva have amyl amylase. Amylase, everything that ends in ASE is an enzyme. Amylase is going to digest carbohydrates. So you want an example, put a piece of bread on your mouth put a piece of bread in your mouth, and the amylase of your saliva are going to break down the starch. So the starch itself is not sweet. It's not sweet. But the glucose, yes. So the monosaccharides, the glucose is sweet. It's sweet. But actually the starch, not. So the amylase, what it's doing is to break down the, the starch and turn it into glucose. So that means the piece of bread in your mouth becomes sweet after a few moments because the amylase, that is the enzyme that is in the saliva, are going to break it down. Other components that are going to break down the saliva is the water, the hydrolysis. That's what I said, hydrol hydrolyze, hydrolysis. Example of that, go to your kitchen, put a piece of bread in the sink with water, become come back in one minute and you will see the bread is totally spread out. It's breaking down in pieces. That is a reaction called uh, uh, hydrolysis, hydrolysis, hydrolysis. And this is the hydrol hydrolyze the, the starch. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right, so absorption is, uh, as I mentioned uh, for the second time, we are a third time, move what is absorption absorption moving of liquid or solutes across a cell membrane all right by diffusion or by osmosis so that is absorption remember we was talking about the simple diffusion and we was talking about the facilitate diffusion that is absorption so that is a type of actually a cell trans uh, cell membrane transportation okay absorption then we are going to have the distribution. Distribution. So the distribution is happening of this. Look at this. You have the ingestion, the bolus, then the chime going to the stomach. Basically, chemical reactions are going to happen. Most, most of the digestion are going to occur in the stomach. So we have ingestion, digestion, and then they are going to be absorbed by the intestines. The absorption in the intestines are going to get into the bloodstream. And it's in the bloodstream where it's going to be distributed. It's going to be distributed. It's going to be distributed. Okay? It's going to be distributed through the bloodstream. It's going to have distribution. Now, distribution, then they're going to go to the whole cells in the body, the whole cells. And that is called the distribution of the of the nutrients into the organ tissues distribution. 
Then we have the cellular metabolism. From the blood, they go to the cells. They are going to get into the cells. So getting into the cells is where the glucose are going to be <coughs> passing the cell membrane and get into the mitochondria to produce the ATPs. Assimilation. Assimilation for the second time to reinforce here is the incorporation of digested substance from the food into tissues of, of an organism. So what is the conclusion? Nutrients become part of our body. That's what I mentioned before. Okay? Yes. Yeah. And number six, we have the waste elimination. The waste elimination. Waste elimination is like uh, uh, we have uh, byproducts of the metabolism of this process. So I told you that here we have, this is the glucose, and they are going to turn into the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, they're going to release electrons in order to produce ATPs, each chemical reaction, but at the same time are going to have waste products that are going to be carbon dioxide and water carbon dioxide and water. Just remember, this Krebs cycle is like a car, like a car, a car. A car have the exhaust that are going to release gas, that is the carbon dioxide and the water. Carbon dioxide and the water. So this carbon dioxide, where they go? They go to the bloodstream. They go to the bloodstream. They go to the bloodstream. When they go to the bloodstream, they are going to reach the heart and eliminate it through gas uh, exchange into the lungs. And when you exhale, all this carbon dioxide that are being produced by the 100 trillion cells of the body are going to be released into the outside during the exhalation. Okay? You okay with that? So carbon dioxide. So who produced the carbon dioxide? Is the waste product of the cellular cellular metabolism or cellular respiration so where is coming from the carbon dioxide from the cellular respiration is the waste product of the cellular respiration <clears throat> you okay with that yeah yes okay all right so uh, saying that we are going to have our uh, first break uh, what time is it please it's time for a lunch break or a 10 minutes break what do you want let's, let's do a lunch break please okay, okay. i'll go ahead okay. and give you a right now dr g if that's good with you yeah please yeah, sorry, I kind of a little bit disturbed here because my dog is choking to death, so he's dying, I guess. So I don't know how to do class in this case. So uh, I will I will check on her, okay? So I will give you uh, until until twelve o'clock, twelve twelve o'clock, okay? Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Okay, all right, so let's get this started. So we just here in this part, and let's see. All right, so just remember, please, uh, when you are going to have the waste product of the uh, cellular respiration are going to be carbon dioxide, and you can add water, water. We are going to see more in detail that. But just remember, remember that the car, the car is going to be the cell the fuel are going to be the the nutrient the glucose the when they are going to turn on the car they're using oxygen you cannot uh, start your car if we don't have oxygen in the environment when the start start to run use, using the energy they are going to produce uh, carbon dioxide where carbon monoxide where the equivalent in humans is carbon dioxide and the, and water okay all right so let's see, the GC system is involved in many of the steps of nutrient processing. That is all news. It brings the nutrients in by completing ingestion, digestion, absorption, and even some waste elimination. Oh. I cannot believe it. Yes, I cannot believe it. Okay, so uh, it brings the nutrients in complete ingestion, digestion, absorption, the distribution that should be here, that is the distribution is where the food, the nutrients are going to go into the cells and including the liver. The liver is the one who is the big factory, 512 functions. And for that, they, all, most of the nutrients, they go first to the liver, but they can go to other parts of the body as well and the waste product elimination product of the cellular respiration, cellular respiration, okay? All right, so cellular respiration, uh, whenever the body has a choice of which nutrients to use, energy first, that is the money in your pocket, right? So those are the carbohydrates. Why? Because again, for the third time we are repeating, the carbohydrates are easier and faster to obtain energy, right? Easy and faster, okay? All right, so burning and combustion reactions, that is the car that we was talking about. The fuel, the gas, the gas of the car cannot be used for energy if you don't make combustion with the oxygen. Oxygen means the reaction with the oxygen that make the combustion of the, of the fuel. So without oxygen, and the car represents a cell, without oxygen, you cannot have any, any a, a chemical reaction, okay? So as I mentioned here, they are going to produce, it is usually termed, the waste are going to be uh, the carbon dioxide and the water, and the water. Okay, so here we have a car, we have the oxygen, fuel is burned, heat energy, mechanical energy to move the car, the car is moving. The fuel is burned, that means the glucose is burned. Heat energy means chemical reactions energy of molecular bonds. Mechanical energy are going to be the chemical energy of the ATPs that are going to be used for all the activities of your body. So oxygen is going to be everywhere. So for that, it's called the, the, the what? The, the uh, cellular respiration. There you are. Cellular respiration, again. So those are uh, reactions that are going to it happens through oxidation. So please be aware of this word, oxidation. Oxidation 
is the reaction of something with the oxygen. You want proof of that? Let's have a homework. Homework, take a metal, iron, put it in your backyard and leave it there for, I don't know, a week or two weeks. And you will see when you're coming back, the, the metal will be rusty, right? So it's not a rust, rust, right? So what does that mean? That means that the iron was reacting with the oxygen. That is called oxidation. It's the process of reaction with the oxygen. That's what means oxidation. So when I said use oxygen, it's the same to say oxidation. So we have the glucose plus oxygen are going to make the ADP at one phosphate. And what you're going to do are ATPs and the waste product, again, the carbon dioxide and the water. Is that clear so far, please? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so this is a process, the first thing that you need to remember, and that is the glycolysis. We have all these process that I'm getting here. So what is the next? Aerobic and aerobic. And with that, actually, is the first level, the first step. And we are going to learn everything about carbohydrates, how they get into the uh, mitochondria to produce ATPs. All right, so let's get started. All right, so here, here we are going to see, uh, I'm going to have a, a, a clean board just to make the summary here, but it's very important to know this. So please, let's start, okay? So you need to remember everything I'm going to tell you. So that is the summary in nutshell without losing any important details. So knowing that, you can tell how the glucose produces energy. All right, so here we have, let's suppose that this is the cell. This is the cell. This is the cell. This cell, here we have the nucleus, just to illustrate a little bit. Here we have the, the uh, of course. Okay, here we have the cell, and here we have the glucose. This is the glucose. Where, where how the glucose get into, this is the blood, let's make it the blood here. This is the blood outside of the cell. Let's represent this, the, the blood. We have molecules of glucose. These molecules of glucose, we are going to have it after you have a meal. You have a meal, you have uh, bread, you have uh, an apple, you have something. They're going to be ingest. Ingest are going to be called bolus. The bolus go down to the stomach, are going to change into name chime. Chime is going to be basically digested by the gastric acid, the HCL. Then it's going to be uh, the digestion, what is coming later, the absorption. What is happening in the absorption? Absorption happens in the intestines. The stomach do not have absorption. They have a little bit of absorption, alcohol and water, but that is not relevant. So the majority of absorption are going to happen in the intestines, a small and large intestine. Then after that is going to be absorbed and then go to the bloodstream where it's going to be the distribution. The bloodstream is like the 101 highway to 80, El Camino Real, 35, whatever uh, a highway you do. The cars are going to be the nutrients. They are going to be distributed into the body. So they can go to the cells, and the majority of them, they go first into the liver, where it's going to be processed, all right? So then after that, they are going to have the cellular respiration, cellular respiration. So you're going to have the oxygen that you inhale, that, uh, I mean, inhale, yes, and they are going to go to the bloodstream. The oxygen go into the cells as well through simple diffusion, gas exchange. And they are going, not only in the alveoli and the, and the capillary, it's going to be in every single cell are going, as well, are going to pass the oxygen into the cell. And then it's going to happen this cellular respiration. In the cellular respiration are going to be used the oxygen and produce the, the ATPs, the ATPs, and produce a waste product, the water and carbon dioxide. So the glucose is in the blood after the ingestion, uh, digestion, absorption, distribution, they get, they get into the cell. 
when they get into the cell, the glucose, the glucose are going to turn into a substance. Okay, so you need to memorize this. Okay, we have what we call the pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Okay, I'm going to write it on there. The pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Or called pyruvate. Either way, pyruvic acid and pyruvate. Okay? This pyruvic acid then are going to turn into acid, uh, ac uh, aceto CoA. Aceto CoA. Aceto -co coenzyme A. So it's aceto CoA. So these are the names that you are going to ask in the exam. Okay? So let's stop here for a moment. So the glucose, when they get into the pyruvic acid, they are going to go turn into pyruvic acid. But look at this, very important. Pyruvic acid can turn into glucose again. So that means that this, this is a reversible, reversible reaction. Reversible reaction. So this reversible reaction is between the glucose and the pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid to glucose. So how we are going to understand that? How we are, why we need to know that? Why? Because they're going to tell you, for example, they're going to ask you, fats can, can produce glucose? No. Fats cannot produce glucose. Uh, proteins can produce glucose? Yes, can produce glucose. That is what is coming. So you, I, I put the, the, the base of what you need to know. Right? So glucose turned into pyruvic acid, and pyruvic acid turns into glucose. Okay? The pyruvic acid, some of them are going to go into acetyl-CoA. This reaction are going to happen in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm. So we have this reaction, glucose to pyruvic acid, glucose to pyruvic acid, glucose to pyruvic acid occurs in the cytoplasm. Are going to be a reversible reaction. And they are going to produce two ATPs. Two ATPs, two ATPs. They are going, going to produce two ATPs. These reactions are going to release two ATPs. And the last one that you need to remember is that this, uh, what are you doing? Cytoplasm reversal uh, ATPs, and, uh, my God, I'm blank right now. Reversible, a, two ATPs, cytoplasm, and, oh, yeah. And it's going to be anaerobic anaerobic all right so listen to this anaerobic means no need of oxygen no oxygen is needed anaerobic and means no aerobic means oxygen right so no oxygen so this reaction between the glucose and pyruvic acid are going to be is going to be an anaerobic reaction there is no oxygen Remember, I was telling you in the previous hour that 99% of the reactions in the body, they need oxygen. I said 99. What about the 1%? This is the 1%. And all this process from glucose to pyruvic acid is going to be called the glycolysis. 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 Okay? We okay with that? Sorry, is glycolysis, glycolysis or glycolysis? How do you pronounce that? Glycolysis. Glycolysis, right? Thank you. Okay? Glycolysis. So that is the glycolysis. So what you need to remember is this. What is glycolysis? Glycolysis is when the glucose turns into pyruvic acid. That is a, re a reversible reaction. They are going to produce two ATPs happening in the cytoplasm, and they are going to not, they are not need of oxygen. So it's an anaerobic reaction. Is that clear? Yep. Yes. Okay. So everybody repeat one time at least, please. Pyruvic acid, please. Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Okay. Don't get surprised. Sometimes they call pyruvate. It's the same. Okay. Most commonly, we call, I put everything on the on the table because uh, I don't want you to be surprised. So pyruvic acid is the same to say pyruvate. All right, so now, now that we already know the uh, glycolysis, glycolysis, glucose to pyruvic acid, let's go to the acetyl-CoA. 
Acetylcholine is a very important component because this is what we call the transition between this and the Krebs cycle. So this is the transition. Transition. This transition, there is no ATPs formation. There is no ATPs. And it's occur in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm. Okay? Now, from the acetyl-CoA, now guess what? They are going to get into the Krebs cycle. If that is the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. This Krebs cycle are going to have 12 reactions. 12, rea 12. One reaction, two reactions, three reactions, four reactions, five reactions are going to do it, six reactions, seven reactions, eight reactions, nine reactions, ten reactions. 11 reactions and 12 reactions. So all are 12 reactions, one after another. So one substance are going to turn into something else and they're going to continue. And that that substance as well are going to be transformed in something, are going to, the remnants are going to continue. And there are going to be a cycle that is going to be repeated, 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 and repeated. So what is happening here? In, during these reactions, they are going to release, they are going to release electrons. So they are going to release electrons, 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 electrons. They are going to release electrons, electrons. They are going to release electrons. What are being used these electrons for? To produce ATPs, to glue one of the, one phosphate into the ADP. So that is basically what is happening with these reactions. These reactions after the acetyl-CoA are going to enter into the mitochondria. So the Krebs cycle are going to occur in, inside the mitochondria. Inside the mitochondria. Yeah? So that is the, that is the Krebs cycle. What is happening in the, the Krebs cycle? Inside the mitochondria. In addition to that, they are going to release, they are going to release Carbon dioxide as a waste product, carbon dioxide and water, carbon dioxide and water, carbon dioxide and water, Car carbon dioxide and water. This carbon dioxide and water, where they go? They go to the blood, to the bloodstream. So that is where it's coming from our carbon dioxide. When you're breathing, where are going the, when you're breathing in, is the oxygen where is going to go the oxygen to the cells for cell respiration so happen and one thing here this Krebs cycle is aerobic 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 so all these need oxygen remember this like a cycle oh oh this is oh right oh oxygen oxygen we need oxygen for these reactions so this Krebs cycle are going to occur in the mitochondria, 12 reactions, release energy to produce ATPs, are going to be aerobic because they need oxygen and is going to produce waste product that is going to be the carbon dioxide and water. Just remember the example of the car. You okay with that? Yep. Yes. Okay, so let's keep going. So here we have the cellular respiration have three major components. The glycolysis, right, follow an intermediate step, that is the aceto, aceto, uh, aceto-CoA, the aceto-CoA, enter into the Krebs cycle, and at the end, we are going to talk about the ETC, the electron transport chain. But just remember, glucose enter into the cytoplasm. They are going to produce two ATPs, are going to be a, a, a reversible reaction and it's going to be anaerobic, no need of oxygen. These uh, uh, pyruvic acids are going to enter, are going to be transformed into aceto, uh, aceto-CoA, aceto-CoA, aceto-CoA. This aceto-CoA enter into the mitochondria, into the mitochondria. One thing I forgot to mention here is this. Look at that. From pyruvic acid to aceto-CoA is in one direction in one direction. So that means that pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA 
pyruvic acid can turn into acetyl-CoA, but acetyl-CoA cannot go back to pyruvic acid. This is huge, okay? So acetyl-CoA cannot go back to pyruvic acid. So that is an irreversible reaction, irreversible reaction. So it's not reversible. So this reaction is irreversible. The one who is reversible are the glucose and the pyruvic acid, okay? So that is crucial. That is crucial. That is very important to know, okay? All right, so yes, now you will help me now. I want you to tell me as a group everything that I just mentioned. Okay, so let's suppose that this, this slide is the cell. Okay, so this is the outside of, this is outside, that's the cell, and we have the glucose. So what is the first thing is going to happen? Everybody, please participate, okay? I don't want to call one by one. What is going to do the, the, the glucose? Glucose will move into the cell. Excellent. Glucose move into the cell. Everybody, please. So then what happened? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Excellent. It's going to be the glycolysis. That is going to happen, the glycolysis. Like, my God. <laughs> I don't know, after today, I'm going to teach in the class because I cannot stand my dog is choking. I don't know what's going on. I'm helping her, but I don't know. She eat the plastic, she vomit, and, uh, and, uh, and well, anyhow. Glycolysis. Then the gl glucose is going to turn into what? Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. Everybody, very good. Pyruvic acid. So this reaction is what? Reversible or irreversible? Reversible. 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 Excellent. How many ATPs are going to be formed in this in this process? Two. Two ATPs. Are going to be produced two ATPs. Very good. Two ATPs. That is going to occur in the cytoplasma, correct? Yes. yes. And, and it's going to, this is a reversible reaction, correct? Yeah. Yes. And this is going to use oxygen or no? No oxygen needed. And that is called? An aerobic. An aerobic. Excellent. So you have many points for the midterm exam. Then, after the glycolysis finished here, this is the glycolysis happening in the cytoplasm, two ATP reversible reaction and aerobic. The pyruvic acid is going to turn into what? Acetyl. Acetyl. As aceto, aceti, aceto coe, aceto coe, aceto coe, aceto coe. Okay. This acetyl-CoA between the pyruvic acid and acetyl-CoA is reversible or irreversible reaction? Irris irreversible. Irreversible reaction. So that's why I put one line here, reversible reaction. Okay, then what happened? Let's put another color here. Oh, yeah, yellow is okay. Are going to enter into what? What is this called? Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. It's a Krebs cycle. How many reactions we have? 12. 12. 12 reactions. <clears throat> Each reactions are going to release what? CO2 and water. CO2, what else? Water, what else? Electrons. Electrons. There you are. Release all these three. These electrons are going to be used to take a phosphate and glue it into the ADP to produce ATP. You okay with that? So acetocoate. And the last thing, see the most important thing, is that this, this cycle are going to produce, but basically it's aerobic, you already know, right? Aerobic, right? They need oxygen, oxygen, and produce 36 ATPs. They are going to produce 36 ATPs. 36 ATPs. All right? So, yeah, I know. Some of you say, but I said 38. Yes, 38, yes. 38 is because in the process, they're producing total 38, but two are going to be used for the process itself. 
All right? So, but net number of ATPs are going to be 36. Okay? All right? We get that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now let's let's review here again for the third or fourth time. Third time. Uh, glycolysis are going to produce two ATPs. They are going to, where is it going to happen? Cytoplasm. It's going to be anaerobic. It's going to be a reversible reaction. Are going to produce the pyruvate. Glucose go into pyruvate or pyruvic acid. It's the same. Net production, two ATPs. Okay? Then the, so now you can understand down here. Here we have, this is the glucose. The glucose are going to, in glycolysis, produce two ATPs, two ATPs. Then the acetocoA that are going to be pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid, and then pyruvic acid turns into uh, acetocoA. And the acetocoA go into the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle are going to be 36 here. 36, but anyhow. Electron, so what is this? The mitochondria is going to be like this. Remember, I was, we will mention like an oyster, I'm going to make it like this. This is basically the, the, the bacteria, I mean, the mitochondria. It's theorized that this in the past was a bacteria, but anyhow, it is. So that is the, so all this is a wall, the wall, walls, wall. It's called the mitochondrial crests. So, Okay, so it's getting shape. So it's worth it the time to do this because I want you to have a good idea of what we are doing here. So can you see the shape of the mitochondria? Okay. Yep. All right. Excellent. Yeah. So now here I want you to see. Here we have the Krebs cycle happening here, all the way here in the in the center are going to happen the the what the uh, Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle are going to have electrons, are going to release electrons, 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 electrons. These electrons are going to be transport. Electrons are transport, transport by the electron transport chain. Where is this transport chain here on the on these areas? So they are going to just pass like a hot potato one to another place. So you are the electron chain. You're going to pass what you have in your hands to the, to the next one. And they are going to transport the electrons. They are going to transport to where? To the ADP. And the ADP, when they receive the phosphate, are going to lead into ATPs. ATPs. So who is that? Is the electron transport chain, the ETC, the electron transport chain. What is doing the electron transport chain? It's going to transport the electrons, and that is going to lead into the production of ATPs. 36 ATPs, these ATPs are going to go out of the mitochondria, and they are going to be used by the cell. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. All right. So here we have, uh, let's see. So what is important here, the intermediate, what is the intermediate? Intermediate is when they have, uh, go from pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid into acetocoe. Aceto, acetocoe. This acetocoe, uh, here is a irreversible reaction. It's going to be only in one direction. So pyruvic acid can, can, can go into acetocoA, but acetocoA cannot go back to pyruvic acid. So that means this. Let me see here. Let me go here, just a moment. Uh, let's go wait for a moment. So what does it mean? That means this. If, look at this. If you have glucose to pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid can turn into glucose. But if you have acetocoA, and that is what is important, very important, when you have acetocoA, acetocoA can produce glucose, yes or no? 
No. No, right? Why? Because we have a block here. We have a, 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 a blockage here because this is irreversible. So that means that pyruvic acid can go to acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA cannot get into pyruvic acid. It will be the it will be the situation that they can turn into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will be able to produce glucose, right? Because pyruvic acid and glucose are, re are reversible, but it's not. So acetyl-CoA cannot produce glucose. Acetyl-CoA cannot produce glucose. Write it down, 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 down that. So acetyl-CoA cannot produce glucose, cannot be turned or converted into glucose. Why? Because there is a, an irreversible reaction between the acetyl-CoA and the pyruvic acid. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right, so Krebs cycle are going to use two ATPs. Okay, it's called the citric acid or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Either way. So if you see here in this in this graphic, we have the pyruvic acid that we already talked about, the pyruvic acid part that is the end of the glycolysis. So glycolysis, where is going to start with the glucose? Where is it going to end in the pyruvic acid? Period. Then we have the intermediate process. Intermediate process is an irreversible reaction that is going to turn the pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA get into the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle are going to release electrons, electrons, electrons. At the same time, they are going to release carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide to the blood, and actually as well water. All right, so we're okay with that. We have 12 chemical reactions, 12 chemical reactions. Like, remember the clock. Okay, so let's see. All right, so let's go back to our, our graphic and you will see how easy it's going to be. All right, so here we have all these blue on the chart are going to be the cytoplasm, the water, okay? So we have carbohydrates, we have the glucose that we use as an example, but the monomers like fructose and galactose can happen as, can do the same as well, okay? Not only glucose, so all the monomers, all the uh, monosaccharides. So they are going to go into, forget about this for a moment, and you're going to get directly into pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. If you see here, this line that is coming from the glucose are going to turn into pyruvic acid. That is what we call the glycolysis. Glycolysis. So pyruvic acid. But it's reversible. This reversible are going to, pyruvic acid can turn into glucose again. Okay? Forget about the gluconeogenesis for a moment. All right? So that is pyruvic acid. One arrow down, one arrow up. So that is reversible. What is here is the glucose. Is the glucose. Then the pyruvic acid turns into acetyl-CoA. That is acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA are going to enter into the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is going to be the place for the Krebs cycle, for the Krebs cycle. They are going to release electrons, release electrons. They are going to go into the electron transport chain, and they are going to find the ADP, the uncharged battery, and they are going to bring that energy is needed to use to add to the ADP one more phosphate and lead into ATPs. You okay with that? Yep. Yes. yes. All right, so let's focus now in the reversible and irreversible. Look at this. So all what I explained to you are going to be used for, in addition to other things, to this. Look at that. So if you eat carbohydrates, if you eat carbohydrates, okay? If you eat fats, look at this. If you eat the fats, the fat is more simple, but look at this. Fats are going to turn into what? Into acetyl-CoA as well. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. So now, tell me, when, when, you, when you eat uh, carbohydrates, the carbohydrates are going to be used for acetyl-CoA and produce the ATPs. Excellent. Now, what happens when you eat too much sugar? What happens if you eat too much carbohydrates? You're going to gain weight, yes or no, right? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. And actually, you're going to gain fat. If you see here, the carbohydrates, the glucose are going to go this way, this way, this way, go to acetyl-CoA. And when you eat too much sugar, too much carbohydrates, they are going to go to produce ATP, what you require in a day, and the rest, what happened? See? Can turn into fat from the acetyl-CoA. Now, let's do the opposite. If you eat fat, you eat a lot of fat, of course, you are going to gain weight. But if you eat fat, the fat are going to go into acetyl-CoA. The question is, the fat can produce glucose, can turn into glucose, yes or no? No. No, right? Why? Because this reaction is irreversible. Because if you have too much fat, they produce a lot of acetyl-CoA, right? So if, 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 but it's not, if these reactions are going to be reversible, pyruvic acid and acetyl-CoA, the fat will be, the acetyl-CoA coming from the fat turn into pyruvic acid and pyruvic acid go into glucose. But that is never going to happen. So fat never produce glucose. Are you okay with that? Yep. Yes. Now, if you eat a lot of fat, a lot, a lot of fat, these fat are going to go to produce acetyl-CoA. But if you, you don't need more fat, so what are you going to do with the excess of fat? The fat are going to, from acetyl-CoA, return and produce more fat. You okay with that? Good. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So now you can tell me, when you have a surplus, a surplus of carbohydrates are going to produce are going to produce fat, are going to produce fat. So, and the fat, when you have a surplus of fat, are going to produce more fat. So period, fat produce fat. Excess of carbohydrates produce fat. So, and the word fat, carbs into fat, fat into fat, carbs into fat, fat into fat. Okay, all right. So, and one thing I want to tell you ahead of time, because it looks like you understood very well this, is this. Please, write it down, this, please. Okay? Before that, I will tell you, when you start to gain weight, when you start to gain weight, when you start to gain weight, very simple. Listen, the statement I want to tell you is this. The body, write down this, body, do not, body, do not produce, body, do not produce, body, do not produce more ATPs, more ATPs than it needed in a day. Okay. We do not, the body do not produce more ATPs than you need in a day. The body do not produce more ATPs than you need in a day. So, for example, if you have, you have certain activity during the day, so you need energy for that, correct? When you, sat, you need to eat, you need to eat to satisfy the energy needs. So you eat and that food is going to turn into ATPs. But once you already complete your requirements of ATPs during that day, if you are still eating, they are going to accumulate as acetyl-CoA, but acetyl-CoA will not get into the Krebs cycle. Why? Because you don't need to produce more ATPs. Is that clear? Yeah. So that acetyl-CoA that cannot go into the Krebs cycle because you don't need any more ATPs because you already have all your ATPs requiring a day, that acetyl-CoA turns into fat. Got it? Yes. Yes. When you have a high metabolism, when you have a high metabolism, you need more energy, so you need to eat more. 
But if you are couch potato, you are basically resting, watching TV all day and do nothing. Your requirements of energy are low. Your metabolic rate is down, yes or no? Metabolic rate means that you need less, less ATPs. But you eat, 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 eat. So when you eat, that, is, that food is going to turn into the ATP that you need that day. But because you are resting, you are not doing anything, you have low need of ATP. But if you're still eating, that surplus of food are going to turn into fat. Is that clear or no? We okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, all right. So, cytochrome is just a protein. I'm not going to go on that. Okay. So, aerobic. So, that is the aerobic. So, when I said, so that is basically this. Uh, all right. So, all right, so I'm going to talk about two more terms here. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so you have, and let me see what it said here. Uh, fermentation, gluconeogenesis, okay. All right, so one thing I want to go here is in this graphic that is uh, important here. Okay. Uh, do you go to the gym or you had been going to the in the gym in the past, right? You've been going to the past the, the gym, right? So what happened? What happened when you are you're paying your fee, your your you bought your tennis shoes, your new uh, pants, whatever, right? So are you already yes to do to do exercises, right? So the first day, obviously everybody is very enthusiastic, right? And they're going to overdo, right? So they're going to do a lot of exercises, a lot of exercises. All right, so this, then they tell you, uh, if you have a coach, they tell you uh, how much, how many days I need to come to be body, I mean, to have, a, to, uh, to come to the, to the gym. And they tell you three times, right? They tell you that or no? You need to come three times average, correct? in a week yes. right yes or no yes why is that because you know they don't want you to come because you are not actually uh, uh, because they they want more people uh, not to busy or what no it's not there is a reason for that the reason for that is this tell me one thing when you are doing over exercising what happened? You go to the bed to, uh, at night, you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes, but you cannot move your body, right? Because you are in sore. You're, all your body is in pain. Yes or no? Right? Yeah. Okay. Why is that? Why? Because you was overdoing exercises. Can I explain that? Yes, I can explain that. And I will explain to you right now. Look at this chart. In this chart, are going to tell you you have the carbohydrates so you're doing exercises go to the gym do exercises exercises so what happened that are going to get into glycolysis they are going to produce pyruvic acid acetyl-CoA and you start to produce ATPs 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 excellent okay but what is here the the the, the main thing that are going to produce ATPs are going to be the oxygen oxygen the 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 coach is telling you can you breathe deep all right deep breathing right so every uh, every amount of exercises you need to breathe in a big uh, a good volume of oxygen right air correct so why is that why is that because you your your lung capacities your lung volumes are not trained yet to expand when you are doing exercises yet with practice yes you're going to incorporate more oxygen into your lungs into your body but at the beginning you are not trained for that for that yet so what happened you're still doing exercises and you need oxygen 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 but you are not breathing properly you are not breathing correctly you are not breathing 
the, the right volume because you are not trained yet, right? So if you don't have provided enough oxygen to your body, you cannot produce ATPs. You cannot produce ATPs or they are going to produce very low ATPs because you're not breathing, giving the body the oxygen to make the combustion of these reactions. So what is going to happen now? You, but you, you are very stubborn and you start to still doing exercises without doing the oxygenation of your body. So what happened? So acetyl-CoA, you're going to produce a lot of acetyl-CoA. You're going to have a lot of acetyl-CoA waiting for the Krebs cycle to turn into ATPs. But because you are not having enough oxygen, you are not breathing uh, accordingly, they are not going to produce a, too much ATPs. And the acetyl-CoA starts to accumulate, waiting, waiting, but you're not oxygenating. So they cannot go into the Krebs cycle. The acetyl-CoA are going to be accumulated. And what happened? The pyruvic acid that is coming to transform in acetyl-CoA will not be transforming acetyl-CoA anymore. They will not be transforming acetyl-CoA anymore. Why? Because there is too much acetyl-CoA. There's pack, there's jump of acetyl-CoA. So pyruvic acid as well start to go up, accumulate where? In the cytoplasma. It start to accumulate the pyruvic acid. And what happened with the pyruvic acid? The pyruvic acid are going to turn into glucose one, or they can turn into lactic acid. Lactic acid. Lactic acid. They enter into lactic acid. Lactic acid. This lactic acid is going to be accumulate into the muscles, in the muscles. And this accumulation of lactic acid is the cause that you have cramps, muscle ache, muscle sore, sore muscles. That is the lactic acid. You okay with that? We, we are clear on that or not? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now, and guess what? The lactic acid then can turn into pyruvic acid because this is reversible. And in order to, the lactic acid is the one who make you your sore muscles, the muscle being sore, right? Very painful. But the lactic acid can turn little by little as, as the cell rec recover more oxygen into pyruvic acid and then do the scrap cycle. This lactic acid are going to be reabsorbed or disappear in two to three days. Two to three days. So that's why the coach is telling you, you can go to the gym two or three times per week. Is that clear? Because they know that the next day you will be in, in pain. You all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is the lactic acid. Okay, so gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, are you going to mention that? In the gluconeogenesis is here we have the uh, gluconeogenesis. Where is the glucone? There you are. Gluconeogenesis is, we are going to see that later, is the proteins are going to turn into sugar. So proteins can turn into glucose. If you see the line here, proteins can turn into pyruvic acid. And why I say proteins can turn into glucose? Why? Because when proteins get into pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid can turn into, into glucose again. So because it's a reversible reaction. The proteins can, can go directly to acetyl-CoA as well. And proteins can go directly as well to the Krebs cycle. So proteins are very much used for energy when you are deplete the fats and the carbohydrates. So the gluconeogenesis is the process where the, where the proteins are going to turn into glucose. Question is, the proteins can turn into glucose? Yes. So the proteins can give you energy Yes, because proteins turn into glucose. Glucose go into the Krebs cycle. You okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Yes. The glycogen. The glycogen. This is the glycogen. Glycogen, as you remember from previous classes, glycogen is a polysaccharide. It's a polymer, right? 
the glycogen we have mostly accumulated into inside the muscles and the liver. That is where mostly of the glycogen is located. We have maximum two pounds, as you already know. So the glycogen is a storage of carbohydrates. One molecule of glycogen, one molecule of glycogen contain hundreds of molecules of glucose. So when you need glucose, you're going to consume your glycogen first. And the glycogen are going to turn into glucose. The glycogen is going to turn into glucose. And that is called the glycogenolysis. Glyco, glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. So glyco, glycogen, you see, glycogen lysis. So the glycolysis means break it down. Glycogen turn into uh, sugar. And the glucose actually can turn into glycogen as well. So glucose are going to be the glycogenesis. It's going to be the it's going to be the it's going to be the actually glycogenesis. So this, this, and this are going to not ask in the exam next class because it's a little bit more elaborate. So, but I'm just giving you a mention that. So, but there's a lot already information that you have. You okay with that? Or you want me to ask you that? You want me to ask you that? Hello, participation, please. Yes, no? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's talk about fermentation. Fermentation is an anaerobic. Fermentation, we are using fermentation for what? To, to make alcohol, right? Do you know how to make alcohol? From potato, from, from, um, from any, any, any plant you can produce, you can make uh, alcohol. Okay, so fermentation is an anaerobic cellular process in which organic compounds are converted into chemical, into, uh, uh, into simple compounds. Could be water, could be carbon dioxide, and could be alcohol. Alcohol. So fermentation. And they are going to produce some ATPs as well, right? Okay, so what is this? For example, I'm going to give you one example just to not make it so tedious. Is fermentation. So homework, homework. Let's uh, let's let's do alcohol. You want alcohol? Let's do alcohol. Where is uh, Mr. Daniel? Daniel? Hopefully it's okay. He's okay. I think he's okay. alive. I'm not too sure. Oh. Okay. So uh, fermentation. Let's make alcohol. Air. Air. Eric, you, 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 let's do some alcohol, okay? So you're going to boil. You, what do you want to boil? Um, corn or potato? Let's make some corn, okay? You boil corn with all the all the hairs, whatever it is, everything on the corn, everything. You boil it very well for 10, 15 minutes. Very well boiled. 15 minutes boil. Then what happened? You're going to take all the all the all the corn and just keep the water the water you put it in the bottle put it in the bottle bottle you put some gist 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 on the on the on the on the water on the on the fluid and close it very well there is no not even one bubble of air no air at all and leave it there very very much very very tight and wait for three, four days, three, four days. Then you come back to see the bottle and you need to be careful to open the bottle because the bottle is going to basically, the, the cover is going to blow up like this because it's a lot of pressure inside. Yes. Uh, Daniel just texted. I think he texted you, but he, I just want to let you know that his power went out and he's trying to fix it. Yeah, okay, no, tell him no no worries, okay? I, I know that he's doing his best all the time. Okay, all right. okay so tell him that's just yes, to do... Oh, there you are.
Okay, Daniel, see, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. That's okay. We sometimes happen. So take your time, no problem. All right, so we was talking how to produce, how to make alcohol, okay? Alcohol, you boil corn, uh, three, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you remove the corn and put everything in the in the bottle. Put it in the bottle and we put some yeast. Close the bottle without air, not even one bubble of air. Come back in two, three days, and that is going to, you open, it's going to be a lot of gas under pressure because that reaction is, to, is producing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. And then you try and you feel like it's alcohol. Right? Well, I do that, but for cooking purposes. So when I do that, I do the, the, I do the fermentation. That is called the fermentation. And that fermentation gives you a very, a very good cook, by the way. And so any questions, let me know about that because I cook very well. Whatever food you want. But not everything, but most of them. And um, spontaneous. I'm not chef or something. Anyhow, so that is what we call the fermentation. The fermentation. Fermentation. For fermentation, if you touch the bottle, it's hot. It's not, it's not cold. It's hot. Because they are producing a lot of energy there. That those are the ATPs. Is the force of the fermentation. When we are going to use fermentation, fermentation are being used for to produce cheese, cheese, cheese. They produce fermentation with cheese for cheese. Okay. All right. So that is about. A, I think I finished. What? Oh, all right. So let's. Okay. So. I'm going to use five more minutes in order to review this. So the fermentations are going to be cheese, yogurt, salami, soy sauce, black tea. I have a black tea, 100 years old black tea. Yeah. You know what? I have it, but I don't take it because I want to keep it. But anyway, anyhow, chocolate and other foods are going to use the fermentation. Okay. All right. So everybody follow me, please. You, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What is that? Everybody read that, please. Glucose. Glucose. What is going to happen? Oh, this is a glycogen. Okay. So that is something that I'm going to review another time. Now, what happened here? What is this? Glycolysis. But this arrow specific, what is telling you? Reversible. Reversible. To produce what? To produce pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. And the glucose to pyruvic acid is called what? Glycolysis. 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 It's going to produce glycolysis. Right? So when you have lack of oxygen, when you're doing overdoing exercises and you, we don't, you don't breathe properly, the pyruvic acid turns into lactic acid. And the lactic acid can turn into pyruvic acid later on. That is going to take about three days. Then we have what? It's going to produce what? Everybody, please tell me. Acetone coenzyme. Acetocoe. Acetocoe. Excellent. Acetocoe. This arrow, this arrow indicate what? Only one reaction. Irreversible. Irreversible. Excellent. Okay. And then the Cytocoe is going to go where? Krebs cycle. Krebs. To the Krebs cycle. There you are, the Cytocoe. And then this Cytocoe go to where? You said into the, everybody? Krebs cycle. Into the Krebs cycle. So we have 12 reactions. You count, there are 12. 12 reactions here. They are going to be coming one after another. In each reaction, what they are going to release are hydrogen, but actually releasing electrons, right? They are releasing electrons. They call the NAT and PAT. We don't care about that. So those are complexes that transport the hydrogen and take the electron, electrons away to the, uh, to the mitochondria. All right, so to the electron transport chain. So we have all these, they go to the mitochondria, 
we have electrons and see electrons they are going to go to the phosphate to the phosphate to carry and add it to the ADP and the ADP plus the phosphate are going to produce the ATP remember the Krebs cycle is going to happen in the cyto in the mitochondria and produce 36 ATPs you okay with that yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay, so that is coming later, next class, and we are going to talk, talk about the digestive system after a break. Okay? So, but again, review. All right, so glucose into pyruvic acid to ATP cytoplasm anaerobic glycolysis. You follow me? Pyruvic yeah, yeah. acid into acetyl-CoA, irreversible reaction. Then acetyl-CoA get into the Krebs cycle that is inside the mitochondria. They need oxygen, it's aerobic, produce 36 ATPs. And uh, 36 ATPs, that's it. I forgot to mention that uh, the glycolysis do not use oxygen. Is anaerobic. All right, guys. See, now this graphic that I was showing you at the very beginning that was kind of a little bit kind of scary is going to be your best friend now. Okay, look at that. Basically, you can tell me everything now. Okay, we got it? Yes. Got it. So yeah. I will uh, see you in 10 minutes, one seventeen. Okay, thank you.
Okay, guys. Hello. Okay. Any questions from the previous? No. No. So, I I I touch everything that we need for that topic. Okay. So you don't need to uh, try to memorize other stuff. Or, or that's exactly what I want you to know. And that is what we are going to use later on. Okay. For example, I will give you the application of that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of extra here. Yes, this is not coming for the exam, but I want to show you the reason why. All right, so for example, you have diabetes mellitus. In diabetes mellitus, we have the insulin. Diabetes mellitus type 2 is resistance to the insulin. So the insulin is not working. So what is doing the insulin? The insulin is going to bring glucose inside the cell. When the cells are resistant to the insulin, the insulin, are when they attach to the cell membrane, what happens is that they are going to open the doors for the glucose. But when the insulin is coming in diabetes mellitus type 2, the glucose gets into the, into the cell membrane of the, of the cell and the doors are not opening. And what happened? The glucose cannot get into the cell. And when they not get into the cell, the glucose starts to accumulate in the blood. So do you have high levels of glucose in blood? But the cells are still hungry because the main source of energy is the fuel is going to be the glucose. But we are not able to provide glucose to the to the cells because diabetes mellitus type 2, insulin resistance. The cells are still hungry, so what they are going to do? What they're going to do instead is to use the fats. When they use the fats, the fats are going... So this tot, total is blocked. That is not working in diabetes mellitus. That is not working. But they're going to use energy from the fats. When the fats are going to get into acetocoate, they produce five times more ATPs than the glucose. That is good. But what is bad is what, when it's activated, the main activation of provide energy is the fat, this is going to produce what we call the uh, ketone bodies. Ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are actually very acid. Very acid. And that is going to make your blood very acid. So that is going to make you basically have acidosis in your blood you can actually enter into diabetic ketoacidosis and you can die from that, okay? That is one of the uh, uses that we are going to have in, in, in next courses. But this is need to be set it up very nicely in order to know what is the mechanism of the drugs that you're going to use, how they are going to make this uh, reactivate the glucose enter into the cell. And for that, you need to know this, okay? All right, so that is just uh, an example of how how we apply that, all right? All right, so, of course, I'm not going to ask that in the exam. Okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, let's keep moving, let's keep moving, let's keep moving. Okay, so let's go to the uh, gastrointestinal system. Where are, where are you? Okay, gastrointestinal system. All right, so for this, I'm going to make um, a very a nice brief chart that is that is something you must know. You must know. So we are going to talk about anatomy physiology next class or next uh, course. And we are going to talk in detail about everything. But at this moment, I'm going, I want to give you the Christmas tree first, and then we are going to put the decorations. So progressive systematic learning. Okay, so number one, we are going to talk about the gastrointestinal. Gastro means stomach. I said system. Okay, or oh, you can call the di you can call this the digestive system again. Either way, 
or you can call GI system. So those are the names that we use. Then the GI system are going to divide it in two main components. The upper GI track, I said track, I didn't say system, track, and uh, uh, here we have upper and, all right, so let me, let me reformulate this. All right, so I'm going to divide in the GI track, track, and the accessory audience. Accessory audience. Which are the accessory audience? All what is belong to the GI, GI system. The teeth, the tongue, the salivary glands. You must know this chart very well, for example. Salivary glands are going to be the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So those are those are the accessory organs. The GI tract is not the GI system. GI tract track is the tubing. T tubing. The GI tract are going to be divided in the upper GI tract that they go from the oropharynx that is the cavity of the mouth towards the duodenum. Duodenum. That is the upper GI tract. There's a, a lot of clinical considerations, so we are going to mention a few of them. And then we have the lower GI tract that is going from the jejunum to the rectum. All right, so this is the upper and the lower GI tract. So just remember this chart. We are going to go back to this. All right, so why is that important? We will see that in a few moments. All right, so here we have in this graphic, we have the upper GI tract. The upper GI tract is the oropharynx. It's going to be the esophagus. It's going to be the stomach. And the first portion of the small intestine, that is the, actually, the duodenum. The duodenum, the stomach, esophagus, and the, all the oral cavity. Okay, the salivary glands, the teeth, and the tongue. Up to here is the upper GI tract. Okay, so one thing I want just you not to get confused is on this. So the small intestines. The small intestines are going to be formed by three components. The duodenum, duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The ileum. So that is the small intestine. Okay? The small intestine is what the duodenum is going to be part of the upper GI tract, and the jejunum ileum is going to be part of the lower GI tract. But duod the small intestine have three components duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Now we have the large intestine, so we are going to see the large intestine now here. Oh, where is that? Here, that is the large intestine. The large intestine are going to have the ascending column. Why is called ascending column? Because the fecal material that is here is going to go up here like this. This port portion of the colon or large intestine or large intestine or colon are going to be the transverse colon or the transverse portion of the large intestine. Why is called transverse? 
because it's transverse, right? Now, here we have that descending column. Why is it called the descending column? Because the fecal material go down, it's descending column. Then we have here this area that looks like an S is called the sigmoid column. Sigmoid column. The sigmoid column. The sigmoid column are going to end into the rectum. So we have ascending column, transverse column, descending column, sigmoid, colon sigmoid, or sigmoid column, or colon sigmoids, and the rectum. Other components that you need to remember is this. This first portion, the first portion of the ascending column is called the cecum. Cecum. It's on the cecum that we have this appendix that is called the appendix. Okay? We okay with that? Yes. Okay. So let's keep moving. Okay, so here we have the alimentary canal or alimental canal or the gastrointestinal tract is divided into the upper and the lower GI tract. Okay, so here actually we, uh, we will see all the components that we just mentioned. Okay, so let's keep moving. Let's go to the oropharynx. The oropharynx are going to be everything that is in the mouth. So look like this is the tongue. The tongue is, if you press the tongue down, there is a cavity here. So the tongue is movable, right? So here we have the, uh, the teeth, we have the tongue, 72 pairs, and we have uh, 72, 16 pairs, and we have actually the, uh, the tongue, and the salivary glands. All right, so talking about the salivary glands, question for the exam. Salivary glands, we have three pairs, three pairs. One year ago, they discovered another gland. For the first time, anatomy, they still discovered and see, is the tubular, tubular salivary gland. So it's not in the test. It's not going to be in the textbooks in the next five years. So that is a new discovery. But actually, what we need to remember is that we have three pairs. I didn't say three. I said three pairs. One, three pairs on the left, three pairs on the right. So we have the sublingual gland. Sublingual gland is when you are hungry, you don't salivate. The, the saliva is coming out from your mouth when it's something delicious. Yes, the salivary gland. We have the submandibular gland, submandibular gland, that is more deeper on the floor of the oropharynx. And here we have the parotid gland. This parotid gland, question for the exam, are going to be the largest, the largest salivary gland the largest salivary gland. If you see here, this is the this is the part of the gland. So look at this, it's not basically inside the mouth. Is if you touch here anterior to your ear, this area is where you're going to have the part of the gland. That is the part of the gland. It's the largest and the one who produces more saliva. Okay? So this part of the gland, I want you to have a homework. You see a duct here? Can you see a duct, a tube here? Do you see that? Now, if you go to the mirror and you try to make an effort and try to put your lip up all the way up, in the second premolar, in the second premolar, on the top, there is going to be an opening. There, you will see a hole there, a little bit of hole, very tiny. This opening is where the parotid gland are going to drain the, 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 what, the saliva. All right, so we have three pairs, three on the right, three on the left, the salivary glands. What is, con what is the, the content, content of the saliva? Saliva is going to contain, the, contain water, electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, sodium, right? Sodium, chloride, potassium, chloride, magnesium, electrolytes, and amylase. 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 Amylase is going to digest 
carbohydrates. That is the function of the amylase. Okay? Water can produce hydrolysis of the carbohydrates. They're going to break it down the carbohydrates as well. All right? So the other name of the saliva is called the thialine. 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 Thialine or saliva. Okay? Thialine. So we have three components of saliva. Saliva. Three. Sal saliva. Three, three syllables. And we have water, electrolytes, and amylase. Are you okay with that? So what is important about the saliva? The saliva is important because they're going to, basically, uh, you cannot pass food that is totally dry. You need to pass to pass in order to lubricate that food, in order to be a slippery and go through, through, the, through the pharynx. So you need basically water, saliva, in order to moisture the area. Saliva is needed as well. That is a nursing consideration. There are some drugs that produce dry mouth. So if you have dry mouth, what is the problem? If you have dry mouth, the mucus are going to get dry. The mucus, mu uh, mucosa, mucosa is the lining of the hollow organ. So we have the lining of the mouth, the lining of the esophagus, the lining of the stomach, the lining of the gallbladder, the, ga the lining of the urinary bladder, lining. That is called, that, that lining is called mucosa, mucosa. So if your mouth is dry, the mucosa is going to get dry. If they get dry, you have, you're going to suffer some cracks on the mouth. So that is a nursing intervention. You will learn that later. So what you need to do is to basically moisture the, the mouth. So rinsing the mouth with water, for example, that will help. Or, for example, give you some candy. Candy is going to stimulate the salivary glands in order to produce saliva. Otherwise, you will have lesions on the on the on the mucosa of the on the lips or the or inside the, of the gums, etc. And that is going to produce problems because the patient have pain and they cannot eat and they can produce malnourished if that is in the long in the long run. Okay? All right, so that is about salivary glands. Now we have the swallowing reflex, the peristalsis. The peristalsis, peristalsis is the contraction and relaxation of the all the GI tract. So the peristalsis is what is is actually a, a, what we a, we are uh, peristalsis. We are going to have what we call the swallowing reflex. All right. So peristalsis is the only thing I want to remember. So remember this from the mouth to the anus. If you take all the GI tract, stretch out all the GI tract, that is going to have 20 feet long. 20 feet long. So if you are six feet, you is three, three, three heights of the of, of person of six feet. It's a long GI tract. Can you imagine that? So why is so long? Why is need to be so long? That's what we are going to explain now. But first of all, let's talk about peristalsis. Peristalsis is going to be a contraction of the esophagus, of the stomach, of the small intestine, and the large intestine. So all the, all the GI tract, upper and lower, are going to have the peristalsis. Why they have peristalsis? Because in the walls of this GI tract, are going to have, we are going to have a muscle, a smooth muscle, that we will talk another time. So now, how we are going to explain peristalsis? I want you to go homework, homework, go to your bed and take the blanket. Take the blanket and shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. When you shake it out, the blanket, you will see that these waves that are coming from your the uh, proximal or closer to your hands, and they're going to go distal to the end of the blanket. Yes or no? Yes. Right? Right? Homework, huh? this is homework. And that is exactly what happened. When you shake the blanket, that represents the swallowing. Swallow, swallow and shake. 
that is a swallowing. That swallowing are going to be producing waves on the blanket. The same, the blanket, who is going to the blanket, all the GI tract. So the peristalsis, this swallowing, this shake are going to go from your mouth, then to the esophagus, then to the stomach, then the small intestine, then to the large intestine. Exactly like when you shake a blanket. There are going to be waves from the beginning to the end of the blanket. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. That, that is called peristalsis. And peristalsis, what it's doing is to move the uh, the, the bolus, the chyme, and the fecal material up, uh, forward. So they the, so they are going to do contractions here, relaxation here. So the foot go from higher pressure to lower pressure. So the foot is going this direction. So you contract the intestine here. When you contract, the, uh, the foot is going to, the fecal material is going to go in this direction. So this portion is going to relax. Then what happened? What happened is this is going to still contracting, but this is going to contract again. The, the one who was relaxed previously contract. So the foot cannot go backward, are going to go forward. And what is forward is going to dilate. And that is how peristalsis is going to work. So peristalsis is going to be unidirectional. So they are going to go in one direction. We okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the sphincters. The sphincters. We have one, two, three, four sphincters. But okay, let's go step by step. Sphincters. What is an a sphincter? A sphincter, five sphincters. So a sphincter. A sphincter is if you have a tube here, this is the this is a tube here, right? Or the gastrointestinal tract. I'm going to make a cross uh, cross sectional cut here. I'm cutting here, and I'm going to see this, right? So this is the lumen. You already know what is lumen. Did I mention what is lumen? Lumen. No. Okay. No, I don't think you mentioned. All right. Very good. So what is lumen? Lumen is the cavity. Cavity. So this is a word I'm going to use a lot. Huh? Cavity of a hollow organ. That is lumen. Lumen is not only for, it's a general term. So we are going to use a lot of that. So you must know right now that. Lumen is the space where the, if you put your, your finger all the way to the stomach, the space that you feel, a space, a space, not a lining, the space, that is the lumen of the stomach. If you put your finger, all the way down to the gallbladder, the space where is the bile is actually the lumen. The lumen of the small intestine, the lumen of the large intestine, the lumen of the urinary bladder, the lumen of the bile duct, the lumen of the pancreatic duct, the lumen, what other lumen? The lumen of the arteries. See? Lumen. Lumen is uh, an artery and hollow organ. So, the space where it's running the blood, that is lumen. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the lumen. This is a cross-section of the GI tract. This is the lumen. But on the wall, on the wall of the of the GI tract, in some parts, in some parts are going to be a muscle that are going to be like a circle like this. Like a circle. Very, very much circle. So what is doing? So this sphincter is going to, when, for example, here, in this, this is the esophagus. The esophagus is, this is the stomach. And here we have an sphincter. A sphincter, here. This sphincter, what it's doing is to open when the bolus are coming and turn into the stomach. That is open. But when it's going, when already passed, that sphincter is going to be closed. So all these fibers that I mentioned here, all these fibers are going to contract and close that opening. So that is the sphincter. What is the function of a sphincter? Is to allow the foot going in one direction. They don't go back to the, from the stomach to the esophagus. Vomit is another stuff. So, but normally, vomit is something abnormal, right? But normally, 
what we have is that sphincter are going to allow the passage of the foot in one direction. So we have, in this case, we have in the transitions of organs, in the transition of the organs. So we have here the esophagus, this is the esophagus, and this is the stomach. The transition between the esophagus and the stomach is going to be this, is going to be an sphincter, a sphincter. We have two sphincters there, but I'm going to mention one because we don't, the lower and upper, we don't care about. So, an sphincter. This sphincter is called what? It's going to be called the gastro. Gastro means uh, stomach. And this esophagus is called the gastroesophageal esophageal sphincter. Okay? So, what is this sphincter? It's the gastroesophageal sphincter. Or esophageal sphincter, whatever you want to call esophageal sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay? All right? We okay with that? So, this is important to know when you are going to have, for example, gastritis. When you have gastritis, this heartburn, this, this uh, sphincter is not working properly. Why? Because you have too much acid in your stomach. This acidity make relax, relax the sphincter, the gastroesophagia, and make the gastric go into the esophagus, having the sensation of heartburn called pyrosis, right? So that is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So that is the uh, application of that. So at this moment, what I want you to remember for the exam is where is this sphincter? And what is the name? The sphincter is in the transition between the esophagus and the stomach. And that is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. You okay with that? Now, the stomach are going to continue and they are going to continue with that duodenum. This is the duodenum. All this is the duodenum. Here's the duodenum. Duodenum, duodenum, duodenum. This is the duodenum. This is another transition. We have the stomach and we have the duodenum here. The transition is in between the soft, uh, between the stomach and the duodenum. Okay? So you can call the gastroduodenal sphincter. That's okay. But we don't call that very often. What we call this sphincter is that pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter. Where is located the pyloric sphincter? It's located in the, between the stomach and the duodenum. You okay with that? So we have two sphincters, the gastroesophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter. You okay? Yep. All right, so here we have the gastroesophageal sphincter, thank you, and here we have the pyloric sphincter. We have other sphincters are going to go here. Sorry for... Uh, what is all the sphincter? Oh, okay, so I can use this. Yeah, I can use this. All right, so here we have the, you know, duodenum is the beginning of the small intestine, right? So we have esophagus, stomach, the transition, gastroesophageal sphincter. The uh, stomach and the small intestine, the first portion in the duodenum, is the gastroduodenal sphincter or pyloric sphincter, most commonly called pyloric sphincter. Then we have the small intestine, and they go towards the large intestine. The small intestine is here, like this. And they are going to go here, attached to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, large intestine uh, uh, at the level of the cecum. This is the cecum, and this we you already know that the small intestine start with the duodenum, then the jejunum, and then the ileum. This portion is the ileum, the ileum. Right. So this is an sphincter again transition between the small intestine and the large intestine. This sphincter is called the ileocecal bulb. Ileocecal bulb or ileocecal sphincter is the transition between the small intestine and the and the what and the large intestine. You okay with that? So we have so far three three sphincters transitions between esophagus and stomach. Transition between the stomach and the small intestine. Parenthesis duodenum. duodenum. And Another transition, a small intestine and the large intestine. The one who is between the stomach and the esophagus is the gastroesophageal sphincter. Between the stomach and the duodenum, a small intestine is the pyloric sphincter. 
and the transition between the small intestine and the large intestine we will call the ileocecal valve. Why ileo? Because it's the ileum. Why cecal? Because it's attached to, it's going to go to the cecum, ileocecal valve. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so uh, functions of the stomach produce hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is the HCl. Remember, hydrogen, don't forget that. Hydrogen is what is become making this acid. Is what is going to make it acid. Acid, the HCl. The mucus. Mucus. Tell me, when you vomit, you, you vomit what? Kind of a mucus, right? It's like a, a very elastic, right? So that is the mucus that is mostly located in the stomach. In the stomach. That mucus is going to protect again the gastric acid. All right, so we will talk about that. All right, so uh, they want to talk about some. All right, so I'm going to make a graphic again. Hopefully, it's giving. Okay, let's draw a stomach. Okay, so that is the stomach. We have the sphincter, everything there, right? Okay, so the stomach are going to, basically, this is the lumen. You, know, you understand the lumen, right? The space of the stomach. Then we have the lining. The lining is going to be called the mucosa. And the mucosa is formed by cells. Cells. Like, all the, if that is the mucosa. How is filled the mucosa? Put your fingers inside your mouth. One finger inside your mouth. What you touch on the inside the mouth, that is mucosa. It's exactly the same sensation when you touch the stomach uh, mucosa. You okay with that? Okay? All right, so these cells are going to produce gastric acid, are going to produce HCL. HCL. It's very acid, really, it's very acid. So the pH of this acidity is actually pH 2. The pH of the stomach is pH 2, pH 2. How to remember that? S2 mac, it sounds very, very bad, right? Stomach, okay, 2, pH 2, very acid. So the question is, why this pH 2 very acid are not going to destroy the mucosa of the stomach. You're talking about ulcers, for example, right? So how is not going to damage this high acidity of the gastric acid, the HCl, gastric acid, gastric acid, right? Are going to destroy the mucosa of the stomach. Very simple. Why? Because in between the lumen and the mucosa, they are going to be uh, a mucus. I didn't, I didn't say mucosa, I said mucus. 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 This is a mucus. Mucus. What is mucus? When you, are, you have a cold, you're congested, you don't produce mucus. You are not sneezing your mucosa. You're sneezing your mucus. So this mucus is actually a mucus. Mucus is produced by the mucosa. So this is a barrier. This is a barrier that is going to protect the stomach from the gastric acid. We okay with that? Yes. yes. Okay. So yes. this gastric acid, this gastric acid are not going to touch the mucosa. So when you have, for example, you have alcohol or you take too much spices or whatever. So you have so much gastric acid that the mucus sometimes is not thick enough. So the gastric acid then is going to be able to touch down the mucosa of the stomach producing ulcers. Okay? We get with that? Yep. Okay, so yes. one more thing here. Okay, so here the, uh, the stomach, in addition, these cells are going to produce what we call the intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor intrinsic factor it's called the if intrinsic factor this intrinsic factor please write it down this 
intrinsic factor is not gastric acid. It's not HCl. So why do we need the intrinsic factor? Intrinsic factor is needed to absorb to absorb vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 are actually main actions to promote cell division, especially the red blood cells. We need vitamin B12 to, to, produce, uh, to produce red blood cells. We produce 2 million red blood cells every single second. Every single second. It's a lot. We will talk about it later. So by vitamin B12, they need to be attached. I intrinsic factor plus vitamin B12. And that this is going to get into the duodeno and then is able to be absorbed. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now, the main function of the stomach is going to be digestion. The duodenum that is here, the duodenum, are going to produce, basically is going to have the digestion here, again, and absorption. Digestion and absorption. So mostly of the chemical digestion are going to occur in the duodenum. We will talk about that another time. Okay? So now, what is the main function of the small intestine? The small intestine are going to be basically the absorption. So the jejunum and the ileum. Basically only just absorption. The duodenum is absorption too, but with digestion. And the, and the large intestine is going to be the absorption of water. Large intestine, absorption of water. Large intestine, the absorption of water. Large intestine, absorption of water. Why just water? Why? Because the small intestine is where mostly of the nutrients are going to be absorbed. Mostly of the nutrients are already being absorbed by the small intestine. And when that happens, the small intestine, the only things that can be absorbed after are going to be water. Why? Because all the nutrients are going to be already absorbed by the small intestine. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's keep going. So they're going to go through the pyloric sphincter, going to go from the stomach to the uh, to the duodenum. That is the pyloric sphincter. The sphincter leading from the stomach into the duodenum is called the pyloric sphincter. The duodenum. Duodenum in Latin means 12 fingers. So that is the length of the duodenum. In the duodenum, we have a very important situation here. So here we have, this is the duodenum. I'm going to draw here. This is the duodenum. And here we have the, the, the stomach. The stomach is here. This is the stomach. Continuation here. Duodenum. But what happened in the duodenum? In the duodenum are going to drain two things. In the duodenum are going to drain the bile and is going to drain the pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice. So bile and pancreatic juice are going to drain into the duodenum. It's a common, a common duct. So both are going to drain in the same duct. The bile, the bile and the pancreas are going to drain through what we call, uh, and that is another sphincter here. This sphincter is called the odi sphincter. What is the odi sphincter? Odi sphincter is where the bile and the pancreatic use are going to drain into the duodenum. All right, so for this, I need to show you this. Look at this. Here is the, the liver, the liver. So please, I want, to, uh, I want you to remember some functions of the liver. A, B, C, and D. 
Uh, okay, so I will. B is the bio. So the rest we are going to learn later. So B is the bio. It's albumin coagulation factors and detoxification. But at this moment, I want you to remember bio. So bile is a cocktail. Bile, bile is a cocktail. Bile is a cocktail because they contain water, electrolytes. They contain bile acid. It's going to emulsify. So I want you to remember emulsify, please. Emulsifier. Emulsifier. Emulsifier is a substance that are going to uh, uh, help to break down the fat. Without this, you cannot absorb fat because they need to be digested. And that bile acid is going to help very much. And cholesterol. Lecithin. Yeah, just remember this. Water, electrolytes, bile acids, and cholesterol. So that is the bile. The bile is produced by the cells of the liver. And this is going to be drained here through the bile ducts. All the bile ducts. The right, the left hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, and they're going to be the common bile duct here. And you can see here the common bile duct, CBD, the common bile duct, that is what I want you to remember, are going to contain the bile that is draining through the, through the sphincter of Odai. Where is that? Is, this is the duodenum. Okay? So the bile, the bile that is produced by the liver that are going to be a store in the gallbladder. It's going to be a storage in the gallbladder. So please remember this. The gallbladder do not produce or produce, produce bile. What is doing the gallbladder is to store the gallbladder. Period. Nothing else. There is some absorption of bile concentration, but but just remember the the gallbladder is going to be the storage where it's going to be storage to the bile. We okay with that? This gallbladder, this gallbladder, are going to drain out here through the what we call the cystic duct. Cystic duct. This is the cystic duct. Cystic duct. And this green stuff is just some. Uh, obstruction that can be gallstones, but another time. So what we need to have in here, gallbladder, cystic duct, and they are going to go to the common hepatic duct. Common, why? Because it's common pathway for the for the left and the hepatic duct, common hepatic duct, a cystic duct, forming the common bile duct. And the common bile duct drain into the duodenum. Now in other, on the other hand, we have the pancreas. Where is the pancreas? The pancreas is this. Remember, the pancreas is using the duodenum as a pillow. Yeah, that's a pillow because the the one portion of the pancreas are going to basically in relation with that duodenum. We we have the head, the neck, the body, the tail. So we don't care about that. But just remember, the pancreas is an intimate relation with that with that duodenum. This we have the pancreatic duct. The pancreatic duct is going to go all the way back here. And this pancreatic duct is called the Wilson's duct. Wilson's duct. Or pancreatic duct. So what you need to remember is what this pancreatic, uh, with pancreatic duct is going to contain the pancreatic use. I'm going to put it here. Pancreatic use. I don't have a space, so I'm going to put it here. Pancreatic use. What is the pancreatic use? Number one, water. Two, electrolytes. Number three, bicarbonate. So important. Bicarbonate. So don't forget that. Bicarbonate. Question for the exam. Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is written like this, so you need to know both ways to both ways to write down this. HCO3 negative, bicarbonate. In the exams, I can put HCO3 or I can put bicarbonate, whatever, right? And this bicarbonate is what is giving the pancreatic use a pH of 12. Huge, important to know. So the gastric acid, pH 2. 
pancreatic use, pH 12. 12. Number four are going to have an enzyme that is called the amylase. Everything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Amylase is going to digest the carbohydrate. Number five, you're going to have the lipase. The lipase. Lipase, lipid, fat. They are going to ACE, enzyme, are going to digest, digest fat. And number six is going to be what? The protease. The protease. Protease is going to digest, ACE enzyme. Protease is going to digest the proteins. They're going to digest proteins. Okay, we got it? Yes. And this pancreatic yeah. juice coming through the pancreatic duct are going to drain into the sphincter of Odai as well. Now, listen to this. So we have enzymes who are going to digest protease proteins, lipase pro uh, fat, amylase carbohydrates. It's going to be here. In addition, it's in the duodenum. Then you have the chyme. The chyme with the gastric acid, they are going to get into the duodenum. And in addition, the bile that is going to get here in order to help digest the fat. So here in the duodenum is where we have most of the chemical reactions for digestion. But at the same time, the duodenum can absorb some nutrients, start to start to, start to absorb some nutrients. And some vitamin, like for example, vitamin B12. You okay? You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is actually what we have here, the common bile duct, the pancreatic duct, and it's going to be the duodenum. Okay? This next picture, you're not going to see it in any book, but just yeah, for you, because this is a physiology. Everything is here, so another time. I'm sorry, can you give me a couple more minutes, please? Yeah, no problem here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. The jejunum, the jejunum is the continuation of the duodenum is where iron is going to be absorbed. Jejunum, iron, okay, jejunum. All right, so here we have the intestine. Oh, let me see what else I have. Okay, we finish. All right, so, okay. Doctor, so, can I yes. just clarify something? So for the um, the spin, the spincher of the Audi, that's the... Odai, Odai, Odai. Oh, the Odai. Yeah. That's um, the bile and the duodenum. Yes, look at this. Okay, very good. So here we have the common bile duct. That is going to come the bile. The pancreatic duct, uh, duct, <laughs> pancreatic duct or Wilson duct are going to be the pancreatic use. Here, we have the bicarbonate, water, electrolytes, amylate, lipase, and proteins. And the bile, we have water, electrolytes, we have cholesterol, bilirubin, and the bile acids. All of these are going to come, all of these are going to come together and drain into the duodenum. All these all this is the duodenum. All this is the duodenum. And all these fluids are going to drain here through the sphincter of Oda. You okay with that? Yes, thank you. Sure. All right, so the last thing we are going to talk about is the um, homework. You're going to have a homework. Go to your bathroom and grab a towel. You grab a towel uh, for shower, right? A good towel. Close your eyes and touch the towel. So that is the lining of the small intestine. Yes, that is the lining of the small intestine. So why is that? Look at this. And for this, I'm going to end two things. So this is the intestine, and this is the lumen. But here we are going to see, this is the beginning, the end. so intestine are going to have these elevations, up and down. Those are fold, folds folds of the mucosa, folds of the mucosa, like this, folds. These folds are going to be called villi. Villi. Villi are actually the continuation of the 
cytoplasmatic membrane of the cells that are lining here. So there are cells here, cell, 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 right? So covered by cells. In addition, on the top of this villi, we have another, like a small hair here. That is, again, the continuation of the cytoplasmatic membrane, again, of the cells who are conforming the line. So we have cells here, cell, 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 cell. Each cell is going to have a villi, a micro villi. So we have villi, this is the villi foldings, and the micro villi. We have micro villi. Why is this for? Now, if you, you have a line like this, look at that, and then you have something like this, okay? If you stretch this line here, you stretch it from here up to here, right? But if you stretch this line here, you're going to go up to here, yes or no, All right? So yes. what is that reason, purpose of this B line? This B line is going to, because the main function of the intestine is the absorption, is the absorption, okay? So this is going to increase the area of absorption. If you remove all the intestines, and you put like a rag, like a carpet in the floor, that area is with a micro villi, and the villi is going to have an area of similar of a tennis court. A tennis court, huge amount, huge area. Each individual, uh, each person, all right? Each person have a tennis court area of in, uh, surface of intestine. And that is why going to increase the area of absorption. They are going to improve improve the absorption. You okay with that? Yes. And the last two things in order to apply what we learned here. Uh, tell me one thing. Uh, when you very common, uh, tell me when you go to a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, what do you eat first? The soup of the New York steak. Soup. The soup. soup right? Why we need to eat the soup first? Because Everybody's doing the same because it's fashionable, because I I cannot do different from others. So why you eat the soup first? Why you don't eat the first uh, steak? Good question, right? Oh, uh, who is it? Uh, Shani, 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 please. <laughs> I need to look your name. Sorry, miss. So what? Do you want to say something? Oh no, I was saying because it's it's probably lighter on your stomach. The steak is heavier. So it's like preparing your body. You're in the right way. So I will tell you this. What is easier to digest? The soup or the steak? Soup. The soup. soup right? So listen to this, this reason. Does you eat the soup always? No, because other people are doing the same. No, there is a reason. The reason is that when you eat the soup, you start to produce gastric acid. And when you have this production of gastric acid, you are preparing, you are preparing your stomach to have acid. So when you finish the soup, you already produce, already have a very nice pool of gastric acid to digest the hard meal that is the meat. Make sense? Yep. Everybody got that? Okay. And the last one, and we, uh, and I, I, I finish here. When you eat something, let's let's go homework, homework, okay, homework. Eat a banana or eat an apple, eat something, and take the time how long you're going to go to the bathroom. Okay, so when you eat something after meals, after meal you eat your steak, whatever, or banana, whatever you eat, and then you go to the bathroom, probably in one hour or two hours, three hours, correct? All right. So tell me, when you go to the bathroom, when you go poo, that poo is what you just ate? Yes or no? No. 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 Okay. You know why? Because we have a large intestine. You, why do we have, and that is the topic I want to finish here. Why do we have a, a long, large uh, intestine? Why? Because that is telling you that we need this area to absorb the nutrients. And whatever you eat today, you're going to go to the bathroom and that waste product of this 
fecal material, or I mean the food turning into fecal material, is going to take about one to two days. One to two days. So what you go to the bathroom right now or today is what you ate one or two days after before. That is telling you something. That is telling you that the body needs about one to two days to absorb efficiently all the nutrients. You got it? Got it. Okay, so uh, I wish I could talk more. I would like to have more, four more hours with you guys, but definitely, yeah, we are going to talk that in anatomy physiology. Please, uh, Marilyn, uh, please, what do you think about the class today? The class was pretty good. Um, it's pretty good. It was just a little faster today. I think just towards the end, you know, we do have to take our breaks, which I appreciate, but usually just toward, towards the end of the class, it's just a little faster, but still a great explanation yeah. on your part. Yeah, that's why we want to uh, start the exam and see every minute counts at the end, right? Every minute. So sorry for the interruptions I have today. It was really kind of uh, you. If you will see that, if I will tell you everything, you will be like, <laughs> ladies. But anyhow, I was trying to keep me myself cool. Thank you so much. If there is any suggestion from from you to make, improve, I will consider that for next time. Thank you, Mario. Uh, please, Erin. Uh, she covered the bases of it like very thorough, like all the other present uh, presentations you've done. Um, yeah, you know, the test was a bit different, but I mean, that's more personal. So I kind of have to like, you know, study a bit more than that, but yeah, it's towards the end. It's a bit faster, but overall it's great. It's great. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Harry. I will consider about the quizzes. Uh, you can uh, be in touch with me to see what's going on. And uh, I can we can talk about study habits or techniques or something, whatever you need. Let me know. I will personalize your, your needs, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Nant, Miss O. Oh, oh. Um yeah, the, the class is very good. Um and now I know about the very basic and the details of the digestive system. Okay, thank you. How how you prefer me to call you, Miss Nant or Miss O O? I like Miss O O. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. You you can yeah. Okay, Miss O O. I like that because I never hear anybody call that. But very nice, very nice. Okay, thank you, thank you, Miss uh, Nant. Any question, please? Uh, you know your quiz. Uh, we will talk about after class. Yes. Okay? yes, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to send a message later. If you're not free right now, I'm going to send a message later about regarding about the quiz and then reschedule for the quiz too. Yeah, yeah, but we, we need to do some adjustments there. So we will yes. talk about that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Shani, please. Shani, right? Shani? Shani? Oh, sounds good. Yeah, Shani. Um, hey, Shani. You know, the the, um, your explanation for everything is, is pretty good. It does go, you know, it gets a little bit, you have to speed up, you know, speed up the lecture at the end because, you know, we don't really have a lot of time. So, it's just more on us that we have to study more because I feel like the lectures are getting a little bit more intense. And so it's going to require, you know, a little bit more study time than, than normal. But everything else was fine. Okay, Michelle. So I'm going to keep the, I'm going, I took a note about that. Thank you so much. Thank any anything, a, any of you, you can call me, contact me any anytime by text, phone, no problem at all. Miss Marcel, please. Um, everything was good. Um, I would maybe suggest our 30 minute break to be cut down to 20, if everyone is okay with that. So that way we have more time to discuss the second part of the lecture. Yeah, we can do that. But uh, actually, the official is between 30 to 40 minutes. But I can we can do that for what do you think? Everybody agree with that? Can we agree with that? Everybody is 20 minutes. Marlene, Daniel, going, okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a very good suggestion. I will do that next class. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Miss. Uh, please, uh, Daniel, your 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 opinion please um everything was uh pretty clear 
my only, I guess it, my only suggestion would be the latter half of focusing on like a system. It seems like we're spending more time on the physiology in the first section of the lecture and less time on the anatomy of the system we're studying, whether it be GI or respiratory, maybe like a slight better balance of so less example, time on the physiology and more time on the anatomy of the system. For, for example, which part is actually you would like to, to change? Maybe less time on some of, like in today's lecture, less time on the physiology. It's, it's hard, right? Because physiology and the anatomy go hand yeah. in hand. It's, it seems like we're going into a lot of depth of the physiology factors and very little depth towards the end of the respiratory system or GI system. Or, for example, which part is not, is not, is not clear or will be uh, better for to reinforce? The, in the it's GI hard, system. right? Uh, uh, just like I said, they go hand in hand, so it's it's hard to kind of determine that. But yeah, uh, actually, uh, to know anatomy, if we if we learn anatomy by anatomy, is like using a lot of memory, a lot of memorization. So it's like, okay, this is the duodenum, this is the ileum, this is the jejunum, this is the, this and that, 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 memorize, memorize, memorize. So that's why it's, yeah, as you said very well, it's kind of difficult to, to separate the physio and the anatomy that eventually we need to know, right? But uh, here, I, what I did is to give the frame of all the names that we need to know, the sphincters that we need to know, and that's it. But we need to know. So you already know the names, the glands, and all that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so basically, uh, this is the anatomy and a little piece of physiology. The, the big physiology is going to occur in the next anatomy and physiology. So this is not the whole, the whole scene. So basically, this is like a kind of introduction. But I'm going to try to do mostly anatomy. But if you want physiology, I'm going to follow your uh, your uh, interest. If you ask me questions, I'm going to get into that. Okay? All right? So okay. Me... okay? All right. Muchas gracias, everyone. So I hope you enjoy as much as I enjoy this class. And, uh, okay, apply everything at home. Apply everything at home. So remember the soup, the steak, the bathroom. Remember all the, the all the all the components we was talking today, the glucose surplus, and what happened? You gain weight or not? Fats. So there is a lot to think about, it, right? So enjoy it, and I I I, I will see you uh, when today is Wednesday, right? Yeah, <laughs> I lose my time. Uh, it's go. I mean, lose the sense of time. Uh, Monday, okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good night, and I will see you next time. Thank you, Dr. G. Bye-bye. Thank you.